I love Good it. afternoon. Welcome to the 1.45 <laughs> p.m. public portion of the closed litigation session of the October 9th, 2018 meeting of the City Council. In this part of the meeting, the Council will receive public testimony. Thereafter, the Council members will move to the Courtyard Conference Room for the closed session. I'd now like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Council Member Crone's absent. He gave, he gave notice that he was not going to make closed session. Um, Matthews? Here. Chase is absent. Brown? Here. Noroyan? Here. Vice Mayor Watkins? Here. And Mayor Terrazas? Here. Before we open public comment, I have a brief announcement. The city attorney will provide a report on items listed on the closed session agenda at the beginning of the 2.06 p.m. public session. Are there any members of the public who wish to speak to any items listed on our closed session agenda? I think that's you. So come on up and you can speak, uh, just go to the mic and you'll have an opportunity to speak. Hi. <laughs> Two minutes, oh my God. Um, hi, you guys have already heard from me by mail. My name is Irene Bush, B-U-S-C-H. And I was enjoying on a weekday, a very empty Cowell Beach, because it was a weekday, um, with low waves, nice placid Cowell Beach. And um, there was a lot of kelp with those little insects around and there was a, this tractor with long fangs that come out where he scooped up, the man driving the tractor, uh, scooped up the icky kelp, fl flicked it back, and was cleaning up the beach. I was um, um, on the north side of the beach. You know, I kind of swam when I saw him, and I was hoping he wouldn't get my bag, and I uh, uh, swam and swam, and uh, I was about the same I was like kind of parallel to him on the north end of the beach and I saw the fork scoop up my um, thermal big bag that I had a lot of stuff enlisted in the correspondence that you have already received from me. Um, I was screaming from the water, stop, stop, but of course the motor was revving up like a, at 300 to 500 decibels, so he couldn't hear me, but um, eventually he, you know, I was jumping up and down and he did stop and I said to him, um, you scooped up my um, bag through, with all my possessions. All I had at that time was me and my wetsuit, no towel, no nothing, no keys to my car, no personal possessions. And I was stranded and my husband had to come all the way down from Livermore, he works at the lab there, and come and rescue me. Um, th we were then shown a big pile of um, icky, um, uh, fetid, stinky, insecty kelp and you can it wasn't continue to just to wrap up the sentence. Uh, but it was too smelly and giant uh, a heap for me to dig through to look for it. And I think that's very unfortunate. And I think that uh, the empl uh, so we I did have a, converse, a brief conversation with him where he said, I am very careful, this could not have happened. And I said, you may try to be careful and this happened. And I, you know, you can't argue. So um, uh, when Jeff was down there, we, Bush, we didn't you. look, we didn't, we didn't Bush? look. Hey, Ms. Bush, if you have your, um, do we have your email address, but if you could, um, Maybe write it down. I'll make sure someone from the risk management department contacts you in regards to the disposition of the claim after our, our uh, opening, our, our uh, public session this afternoon. Was I supposed to say I am asking to be compensated for the lost items? I think it was understood, but I appreciate <laughs> you for saying that. So that's all? Put my email yes, address on? Yes, please. Thank you. Are there any other members who would like to speak to the closed session agenda? Please go ahead, sir. Uh, <clears throat> well, minutes, Jeff. Speak Jeff. to the mic. I'm Jeff Bush, uh, Irene's husband, and I just wanted to explain uh, what happened. I was in uh, Livermore at work about noon. Uh, this, I think it was uh, August 9th, uh, and I got a call from Irene saying uh, that a big bulldozer at the beach had scooped up her bag and she didn't have anything. She had no, uh, no clothes, no car keys, and uh, can I come down and uh, Oh, get another set of car keys and rescue her. So that's what happened. I came down, I spoke to lifeguard, 
lifeguard said, oh yeah, yeah, I, I was here. Uh, he pointed me to a spot where huge mounds of kelp and dirt were. He said, that's where it is, go, you can go look if you want. <laughs> uh, but uh, I was unable to find anything. So I just wanna say I'm corroborating uh, what she said. Thank you, sir. Are there any other members of the public that would like to speak to the closed session agenda item? Seeing none, I will adjourn this meeting to the courtyard conference room where the council will now go into its closed session. Did you see this? Good afternoon. Um, before we open up this session, I'd like to take a moment just to, um, for those that haven't read in the paper or heard about it directly, uh, really um, take a moment to uh, remember uh, Judge Jeff Almquist, who passed away on suddenly on October 7th, 2018, while on vacation in Lyon, France. He was 70 years old. He was a judge of the Santa Cruz Superior Court since October 2003, appointed by Governor Gray Davis, and he served as the court's presiding judge in 2010 and 2011, guiding the court through an extraordinarily difficult crisis with great leadership. Judge Almquist most enjoyed the family law assignment in which he sat for the past seven years in the Watsonville branch. He also sat in the civil and criminal assignments during his bench career. And I was greatly saddened to learn of his passing. I just wanted to take a moment uh, to begin the meeting with a moment of silence for him. And then, so if we do that, I'd appreciate it if we could just uh, silently remember him at this time. Thank you. Okay, before we begin our regular um, city council meeting, we need to have the annual meeting of the Board of Directors of the Industrial Development uh, Authority, the IDA, and the Santa Cruz Public Improvement Financing <laughs> Corporation, SCPIFC. City council members serve as board members on these boards, which were created for the purpose of providing the city an instrument to issue bonds. Annually, while the bonds are in existence, the board members are legally required to hold a meeting of the IDA and SCPIFC. The meetings are procedural and for the purposes of approving minutes and electing new board members. So I'd now like to ask the clerk to, um, well, first of all, call to order the October 9, 2018 annual meeting of the Board of Directors of the Industrial Development Authority and ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Director Crone. Here. 
Matthews? Here. Brown? Here. Noroyan? Here. Watkins? Here. Vice Chair Terrazas? Here. And Chair Chase is absent. Mayor, can I just make a quick comment on um, uh, Judge Almquist's passing? Yes. Um, uh, uh, without losing it, I, I, I remember going with, to him for a meeting in 1997, thinking about running for city council, and he was incredibly helpful. He was giving, he was open, um, and very extremely helpful with um, his years of elective service, and just offering that advice uh, really helped. And um, I share your, your sadness for his passing. Thank you, Chris. If I, if I may as well, since hey, on the I too um, had the opportunity to work with Judge Almquist through our youth programs, and he has been committed for as long as I've been running the programs to supporting youth and preventative upstream investments in children. And so I too was very saddened to hear about that and have been grateful to work with him along the way. Thank you. Okay, we'll go back to the agenda. So, uh, Council Member Matthews. Um, I will go ahead and um, move the um, adoption of minutes. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Oh. Jay? Aye. Sorry. Uh, those opposed? None. That, mass, that motion passes unanimously with Council Member Crone absent, uh, Council Member Chase absent. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, are there any, uh, I, we'll go, actually, before I go on, I, this is something where it is procedural, but are there any members of the public that will wish, wish to speak on this item? Thank you. And the election of officers. I, I will move the election of officers as set forth in the agenda report. There's a second. Second that. A motion by Council Member Matthews, second by um, Vice Mayor Watkins. Are there any members of the public that would like to speak to the, uh, the election of the officers? See none, I'll bring it back um, for a vote. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? That passes unanimously. At this point, I'd like to adjourn uh, the Industrial Development Authority and move on to our main meeting. I'd like to now call to order the October 9th, 2018 annual me meeting of the Board of Directors of the Santa Cruz Public Improvement Financing Corporation. Um, if the clerk would please call uh, the roll. Directors Crone. Here. Matthews. Here. Brown. Here. Noroyan. Here. Watkins. Here. Vice President Terrazas. Here. And President Chase is absent. Okay. All right, um, this is for approval of the minutes of the October 10th, 2017 Santa Cruz Public Improvement Finance Corporation. Are there any members of the public that would like to speak to this item? Okay, seeing none, I'll bring it back to the council for a motion. Council Member Brown. I'll move approval of the minutes. Second. Oh. I'll give that one. Council Member uh, Naroyan. So motion by Council Member uh, Brown, seconded by Council Member Naroyan. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Now I'd like to turn all over to the election of the officers for the, um, for the organization. Move the slate as presented. Second. Motion by Council Member Matthews, second by Vice Mayor Watkins. Um, any members of the public who would like to speak to this item? See none, I'll bring it back to the council for action. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Now we'll go on to the main agenda. And so good afternoon, welcome to our 2.06 um, p.m. session of the October 9th, 2018 <laughs> meeting of the Santa Cruz City Council. I'd now like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Council members Crone. Still here. <laughs> Matthews. Here. Chase is absent. Brown. Here. Naroyan. Here. Vice Mayor Watkins. Here. And Mayor Terrazas. Here. Now, if I can have the clerk please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Clerk, you were really busy today with the numerous roll calls and the pledge. Thank you. Okay, so now at this point in the agenda, it's an opportunity to introduce new employees to the city of Santa Cruz. Um, I'd like to first invite up Director of Parks and Recreation, uh, Tony Elliott. 
<laughs> who was a new employee himself and is now introducing new employees. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor, and good afternoon, Council. Uh, yeah, it's my honor today uh, as a two-week-old employee to introduce Matt Heber. Uh, Matt comes to us from Breckenridge, Colorado. Uh, Matt is with the Parks Maintenance Division. He's in the East Zone. Uh, his supervisor behind us is Mike Godsey uh, in the back. So had an opportunity to meet Matt briefly earlier this week, and Matt, uh, in many ways is kind of an ambassador to the parks. He's got a, a very infectious kind of warming smile and, and greetings. So if you, uh, if you see Matt uh, out in the parks, I think that's the first thing you'll notice. Uh, Matt and his wife, uh, Alicia, have two kids, uh, originally from Chicago, Illinois. Uh, they've moved around a little bit, uh, but are back here in Santa Cruz, uh, again, on the parks maintenance uh, team. So again, it's my privilege and honor today to introduce Matt uh, to you all. Uh, please say hello to him. He may be out at Arana Gulch, Frederick Street Park, places like that. So again, uh, uh, this is Matt. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Welcome, Matt. <laughs> now I'd like to invite up Director of Public Works, Mark Dettel. Good afternoon, Mark Dettel, Director of Public Works. It's my pleasure to introduce, introduce three employees. Uh, next to me is Andrew Cam Camilleri. He's a new service maintenance trainee, uh, works with asphalt patching, cleaning the culverts, um, sign and replacements. Um, he's in streets and traffic. Um, Andrew was actually was born in uh, Oklahoma. In about uh, a few weeks, he ended up moving to California. So um, lived no, most of his life uh, in California. He went to high school in San Jose and then moved to Santa Cruz in 1994. Currently li lives in Live Oak. Um, he, he passed work experience. He worked for C Cloud and now is Alitas for 19 years before uh, working in the telecommunications industry in Union City for about three years where he placed fiber optics for, net, for the uh, fiber networks. And he's had some junior college studying psychology and biology. And when he's not working, he enjoys riding his bike around town, hanging out with his friends. It's a little beach time and enjoying our fine restaurants. So um, please uh, welcome Andrew. And next to Andrew is Miguel. Next to Andrew is Miguel Lazaraga. He's our new assistant engineer. Um, he's working with uh, inspections and development review. Um, Miguel was born in, in La Paz, Mexico and grew up in Santa Cruz. Uh, currently lives in the Seabright area. And he's past work experience. He worked for, worked for Barry Swenson Builders as a project engineer. Kind of we did a trade. We had some, we, the previous position went to Barry Swenson and, and he's come back. So I guess a, <laughs> a player to be named later is, is Miguel here. So, um, and then I also worked for Bowman and, Bowman and Williams and Sencasa, uh, USA Civil as a project engineer. Um, went to Branson 40, New Brighton, Soquel High, Cabrillo College, and San Jose State University. And when he's not working, he enjoys outrigger canoeing, scuba diving, spear fishing, Olympic weightlifting, CrossFit, mountain biking, and camping. And a fun fact, uh, he also enjoys playing the ukulele, so. <laughs> um, and then well, you can welcome uh, Miguel. And next to Miguel is is Ishel uh, Polito. Ishel Polito. She's our new waste reduction assistant. Uh, works with uh, resource recovery. Uh, she was born and raised in Southern California and currently lives in Capitola. Um, <laughs> past work experience mainly with environmental nonprofits like Heal the Bay, LA a Waterkeeper. And during her time with the organizations, she helped educate underrepresented community members about water pollution in Southern California <laughs> beaches and the importance of environmental stewardship. Uh, she attended CSU Long Beach and a double major in anthropology and environmental geology. And during her free time, she enjoys hiking, running, and climbing at the local gym. Uh, fun fact, she's bilingual and can speak Spanish. So please join me in welcoming uh, Shell. Welcome. Welcome to each of you. Okay, now I'd like to invite up the Director of Water, uh, Rosemary Menard. 
Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. I'm pleased here to be here today to introduce Sydney Grube, who's a new Assistant Engineer One with the Water Department. Sydney grew up in Brantwood, but she's come to us recently from her college education, which she graduated from uh, Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo last uh, sep uh, June. And uh, she moved back here to Santa Cruz to take the job that we offered her. And I think she's been here maybe about a month now or maybe a little bit longer. Um, Sydney has um, done internships before with Shelter Dynamics, which is a private design and construction company, Santa Clara Valley Water District, and the city of Redwood City. So she's been working as a number of things related to the sort of water resources issues. And uh, she likes to spend free time visiting with family, friends, relaxing on the beach, ha reading, hanging out with her cat, and finding any new craft or art projects. So the next time we're around when we have the, the um, city art exhibit, we'll be looking for works from Sydney. And she's planning on Andy, uh, attending some evening classes at Cabrillo College starting next semester. Sydney's gonna be working for us on, uh, specifically on the groundwater management issues. She's already been starting to do some works uh, on looking at groundwater monitoring for our wells in the Belts area, the part of the Mid-County Groundwater Agencies. And we had a nice chat about everything that's going on in Mid-County, which is a lot right now. So she's got a really good opportunity to be involved in all the uh, groundwater sustainability planning work that's going on in the area. So please welcome Sydney Group. Welcome. Last uh, meeting we had one of the council members from our sister cities and he was here for the introduction of new employees and they said they didn't do that um, in Italy, but he's gonna start recommending they do that there as well for all new employees at That's their right. meetings. I thought it was nice to, that he was able to see that because it's sometimes unique in other places. Um, I'd like to now um, invite up the Young Writers Project. So I'd like to invite up Julia Ciappella, the director of the Young Writers Program and Martha Mendoza there's going to be a workshop um, this coming weekend and uh, they have, and also Connie Bertuca to talk about the, uh, the program for us this afternoon. Good afternoon, thank you, Mayor for, and Council members for having us here today. I know that I sent along a video, which I'm not sure if we were able to get to, oh, it's gonna play, okay. Um, Do you want me to play it now? Well, first, I just want to say thank you very much for the proclamation today. And as you may know, the Young Writers Program has been around for a few years now. And this uh, essay workshop we are having on Saturday is for our local high school students. And uh, as a project of the Santa Cruz County Office of Education, we are working to embed writing as a significant aspect of students' education. We believe it's absolutely necessary for our democracy, for their critical thinking still skills. So we really appreciate this proclamation and we'd um, love to have you take a look at the video. I was in fourth grade in Notre Dame Academy in Los Angeles, California. I happened to write a poem that subsequently received a lot of attention from the teacher. It got a nice little silver star and a red star, and it got put up on the board. That's a small bit of attention for a small little poem, but it was huge in my mind. The Young Writers Program began in the fall of 2012 as a project of the Santa Cruz County Office of Education. We wanted to generate an opportunity for students around writing that includes plenty of revision and uh, is geared toward publication. So students' writing is gathered into professionally designed and produced books that are then available for purchase to the public through local bookstores. This creates a powerful incentive to write. What's unique about the Young Writers Program is that it affords students an opportunity to have one-on-one -on -one attention with a writing mentor. We recruit volunteers from the community who are trained to work with students and their writing. And they work with students for about six to eight weeks, a couple times a week for an hour each time in grade four through 12 public school classrooms and in our after school writing center, the Word Lab. I think that our public school teachers are put into a bad situation by having 
35 students in a classroom, and there's just no way that they can give each of those students the individualized attention that each of them deserves. And so I think having this additional after-school space for them to tap into that creative writing part of them is really important. I'm used to spending most of my time in isolation with 35 adolescents and to have six to nine members of the community to come and help share my experience and share the experiences of my students is invaluable to everyone involved. Teaching children how to write is a craft and Young Writers Program brings another level to this where no longer is it just an assignment, it becomes a part of their life and something that becomes extremely personal and important to them. The feedback on the NYS program has been nothing short of stellar. And that's from teachers, students, and volunteer participants. I had an opportunity to go to one of the school readings a while back, and the audience was packed with parents and students. And the students had an opportunity to go up and express themselves publicly through their writing. And it's making a difference. It's making a difference in their writing, in their test scores, i um, very pleased to be a part of the uh, program. Writing requires attention. There's no way around that. It requires an adult to listen to a child and to guide them and to hear them, to really hear them. And, the, and you can't do that when you have 30 kids and you're just one adult. The Young Writers Program, through the Word Lab, the Chamber of Heart and Mystery, and through a lot of their other programs, finds a way to bring a passionate teacher in front of a passionate student to allow them to develop their voice. Kids have a lot of emotions. They're going through a lot of things. Their families are going through a lot. They can come to Word Lab and sit down next to an adult who is so invested in them and cares so much about them and about their writing that they can, you know, open up and start to process through their, their emotions through this you know, creative way. I've definitely started enjoying poetry and writing in general, because for a while, writing was something I absolutely hated. Just something I couldn't really enjoy or get creatively into. So it's definitely something that I can honestly say I enjoy now, and my view and outlook on it has definitely changed. One of the things that was so important to me as a teenager growing up and what encouraged my sense of myself as a writer was my high school teacher, Mr. Black. And as a teenager who had been moved frequently and who tended to suffer from bouts of depression, his focus on my writing probably saved my life when I was a teenager. Writing has huge capabilities to not only save individual lives, but to change the world. The Young Writers Program depends on donations from individuals like you to continue this important work. Please consider making a generous contribution today. What a great video. Yeah. Um, hello. Thank you so much, City Council, for supporting us. And um, I just wanted to say a little bit about what's happening this weekend and how it came about very briefly. Um, for many years here in Santa Cruz, as a writer, I was called by anybody who knew me at college essay time to help their kid through their college essays. And um, I always was happy to do that, but it was becoming very busy every fall for me to have one-on-ones with lots of kids. And when I approached Julia and the Young Writers Program about codifying this into something bigger, she immediately said yes, and Connie was ready to go. And so now in our fourth year, we've helped hundreds of kids through their college essays. The young men and women in Santa Cruz have incredible experiences and have done and been through so very much. And to coach them through telling those stories getting them in writing and having them be something that's going to catch the eye of a college admission officer is really an honor and we have an incredible day together. So thank you for your support and I look forward to seeing some of you on Saturday. Thank you. Now I'll just read a little bit of the proclamation, but um, founded in 2012, the Young Writers Program supported over 1,900 students countywide in their writing. And the program has established the Word Lab, Chamber of Heart and Mystery at the Santa Cruz Museum of Art and History. And for the past six years, the Young Writers Program has produced over 40 professionally produced publications of student writing. 
and the Young Writers Program will hold its fourth annual college application essay workshop on October 13th, 2018 for high school juniors and seniors looking for guidance in writing their college essay applications this year. Now therefore I, David Tarasas, Mayor of the City of Santa Cruz, do hereby proclaim the week of October 7th through the 13th as Young Writers Program Week in the City of Santa Cruz and encourage all citizens to join me in congratulating them on their contributions to the Santa Cruz community. So thank you. Can you, can you briefly, as, as I walk down, can you um, tell the public on how students that might wanna attend the, uh, the workshop, how they might do that? Absolutely, so students can go to the Young Writers Program website at youngwritersc.org and our events page there will guide them to the registration both for October 13th this Saturday and October 24th at Pajaro Valley High School. Hey, get one for Ferris here. Hey guys. Hey, hey, hey back, back in line. <laughs> nice. Thank you. David, I have a couple of questions too, if I could ask. Uh, just one other question. I, I do recall in the past you're recruiting for coaches for the college essay and it, uh, obviously it's too late for this year, but could you We have, that? and usually we do that uh, by word of mouth. Um, so far that's sufficed. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure how we'll start to do that differently in the future, but we tend to have a lot of people that respond um, and are very anxious to do this because the day is incredibly rewarding, as Mayor Tarasas can attest to. Um, so it's a, it's a wonderful day for our community man uh, members. And Rochelle has been there too, So and so has um, Council Member Chase. So um, we tend to get the word out as best we can. So if you, know, you would like to help with that at any point, that would be terrific. Yeah. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, it, I'll confirm that it is incredibly rewarding, especially seeing kids that go to college or you know that leave, and you see them back in the community, and you recognize them and talk with them about their experience. So I'm looking forward to being there tomorrow or Saturday. <laughs> okay, thank you. Now I'd like to invite up um, a presentation from Food What uh, and um, Beckman's. This is um, Daron Comunchera from Executive Director of Food What. And I don't know if Sky is with you. Sky is with his baby. Okay, there you go. <laughs> so thanks. I just thought being it's getting up to the holiday season, we just had the Harvest Festival, this would be an appropriate presentation. Got a little tutorial from Bonnie before I began. All right. <laughs> All right, good afternoon, everybody. Hello, everybody back here. <laughs> uh, my name is Daron Comichero. I'm the founder and executive director of Food What, and thank you for having me. There's a million Food What things that I would love to share with you, but Mayor Terrazas invited me today to talk a little bit about our collaboration with Beckman's. And so I have a few slides, and I'll give you a quick overview first of all. So uh, I think it was about two years ago, Mayor Terrazas said to me and to Sky Quinn, who's in upper management at Beckman's, you guys should know each other. You're both feeding a lot of people. Something great could happen. And so he came up to our Santa Cruz site and we showed him around, started talking about the youth empowerment and food work we're doing, and he said, we should make a product together. And this is great, because the previous year we had done sauerkraut with Catherine Lucas from Farmhouse Culture, it was a total hit. Um, from every aspect of the process was a job training opportunity for the young people that we serve, it was, it's fun, it's hands-on, it's experiential, and it's totally, sandwiched right in our mission of growing food, harvesting it, sharing it with the community. So I brought a few slides, and I'll, I'll start with the slide. So this is Elistolia planting this year's crop. 
So this is what most people think of when they think of a pumpkin. I literally grabbed this out of the ground, so I apologize if there's leaves. And do you know what this is called, this part of the pumpkin? Peduncle, it's just a fun word to say. So um, I, I grabbed this on the way out, but we plant a variety called red curry, which is technically a winter squash, and we plant a few hundred row feet, and it yields um, about double that in poundage, and then yields about half that in pies. So this is Elistolia. She's um, planting in uh, probably June. This is Jimmy, also putting, putting the seeds in the ground. And so I just showed you the beginning of this year's crop. This is the end of last year's crop. So Abby, who's in the top left, she's a recent Santa Cruz High alum. And she was in our, <clears throat> she was in our fall program last year. And in the top right corner, she and Ozzy, who recently graduated from Renaissance High School, that is the two of them pouring, basically pouring the pie mixture into the shells at Beckman's. And what's really amazing about this partnership is um, Beckman's being a 30 plus year institution in this community. I remember when I first moved here and I was going to the farmer's market and I just remember seeing this plethora of Beckman's pies. I mean, they're, and, and breads and of course cookies and everything. So Sky said, you know, we. As a company, we really want to support young people. We really want to do something that gives them real world training and job opportunities. So we basically, we at Food What, we, we plant the seeds, we maintain the crop, we harvest it, um, we let them cure, and then we bring it to Beckman's and over two days, we'll make the pies. And this year, we'll make close to 300 pies. And so what are we doing? We are we're slicing, baking, and scooping, and they have these amazing, um, they have these amazing ovens. They're actually called walk-in ovens, which sounds like a terrible thing for a human being. Um, but y you walk in and you put all the all the trays in, and then you walk out, you shut the door, and everything moves. And it's it, the youth were sort of like, oh, this is like Disneyland. This is really cool because we're making food. So I thought that was really positive, and you could see them. The first day was all about creating the stuffing, and then the second day we come back and pour off all the pies. Uh, we work with the Beckman's team to come up with a logo. I think that's, here we go, youth-powered pie, and sourced with organic pumpkins sown, grown, and baked in Santa Cruz by Food Wet Teens um, in partnership with Beckman's. And what's really exciting is last year we made 140 pies. We kept 40 to give to the youth and their families, and we do a little Food Wet Thanksgiving. And then we sold 100, and we sold them very easily. And that was wonderful for a nonprofit to have an income generating stream. We sold them for around $20. And um, so that was $2,000. That was a f the biggest pie sale, you know, bake sale you could imagine, um, with tons of job development in the way. And this year, we actually have a third partner involved, which is New Leaf, and they're very excited to promote this. So they're going to put these in all of their stores, um, put it in their circular that goes out and social media. So it's really become an opportunity for our youth to see their products all over the county and, and even beyond Half Moon Bay and things like that. Went too far. Oh, now she's over there. Hold on. <laughs> Yeah, and this is um, El Stolio and Ozzy last year selling the pies. We also did some marketing at the downtown market. And the last thing I'll share, and if there are any questions or comments, is um, I was hoping to get one of the youth who worked on this last year to come, and the one who may have had an opening in her Cabrillo schedule was Evelyn. <laughs> and, and, I was, and she unfortunately wasn't able to come because she did have a class today, which is wonderful. But I did think about, it would have been a little ironic because she's the only vegan on the crew, so she actually never tasted the pies, but she was very proud of it, and she would have really shared a lot of um, the process and what it meant her to create something and spread it throughout the community. So the last thing I'll say is I really appreciate being called in today. I think you blew it. I think this is the wrong day to have had me because if you had me a month from now, I probably would have been leaving a pie with you. Um, <laughs> you can we'll invite you back. back. Yeah. Oh, I see how this works. Okay, <laughs> now I'll, I'll make sure that the mayor gets a pie and everybody gets a slice, especially you. Thank you for all your help. 
And yeah, that's it. I just wanted to share a little bit about what we're doing. So thanks for the opportunity today. Uh, absolutely. Are there any questions? Uh, Sandy. I actually just have a comment. I, um, I want to say that I, this program is very near and dear to my heart. Uh, I've uh, been acquainted with the students over the years in the program and uh, know Jerome and others who have worked at the program. And I just think, I mean, it's obvious that it's an amazing program. This is an exciting partnership. Um, so I, but I, I want to say that when I, so I worked for a local farm for many years and uh, I, one of my roles was to, to give farm tours and um, Food What came in, it was in the early years. Yeah. Um, I think it was 2006. When did you guys start? Seven or eight, yeah. Seven or eight, okay. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I mean, we did tours with, you know, people from all over the world, delegations, um, lots of people from the sustainable ag world. And the, the students from, the, the young people from Food What by far asked the best questions really probing questions. They really wanted to understand how the farm worked. They wanted to understand what it was like to work on a commercial farm. And it was just amazing. Then I had the privilege of uh, living right next to a farm that operated in Santa Cruz for a long time, Free Will and Farm. And the Food Watt crew would come out. And I also was, at, I did work at home for some days of the week. And I remember when they would come, the excitement just like filled the field in front of my house. And I would go out there every opportunity I had so I could interact with them and get to know them. And it was just amazing to see um, how excited they were about the program and amazing to see your program grow. So thank you, Sandy. I, you know, I encourage people to uh, learn more about Food Watt and support this program however you can. Uh, Chris, I'm going to pile on to that because um, we've known each other for a while and we sent a lot of interns to Food Watt. Um, but what's really important about the program is, in my, and I think, is that it provides an outlet for high school students, which is something that's really missing as, as far as working with your hands and agriculture and stuff, yeah. and because we have a great life lab program mm -hmm. in Santa Cruz County, but it only goes up to a certain grade, you know, sixth grade, uh, you generally. And I think Food What really um, found a niche, and there's a ready audience out there, as you've proven. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'll just say I really am happy that this partnership works, and I know that um, Sky, you know, they've got a brand new baby, but they're also very excited at Beckman's in terms of how they can work with you, and so it's great to see youth working and also creating a new revenue for you at, and your nonprofit through a local business. So congratulations. Yeah, thank you very much. Yep. Thank you all. Have a good day. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, I have a few announcements and then we'll move on to our regular meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on community television, channel 25, and streaming on the city's website at cityofsantacruz.com. Jennifer Cameron is our technician this afternoon and evening, and I'd like to thank her again for her work. All city council members can be emailed at citycouncil at cityofsantacruz.com. If you'd like to communicate with us about an agenda item, we'd like to receive your email by Monday at 5 p.m. before our council meeting. Uh, by sending it then, it will provide us with an opportunity to review your email and include it with the rest of our agenda packet. Please bear in mind that all items of correspondence with the city and city council constitute public records and are generally subject to disclosure upon request by any member of the public. Accordingly, if you have sensitive or private information that you do not wish to be made public, you should not include that information in your correspondence. Our rules of decorum are on the window ledge to my left. It's my job to keep the meeting running without disruption, and we ask that you respect your fellow citizens, um, whether you are inside or outside of the chambers during the meeting. At this point, I'd like to ask uh, any council members if there are any statements of disqualification. Doesn't look like any. Um, and clerk, are there any additions or deletions? No, there aren't. Okay. So in regards to oral communication, some of you may have seen that there's gonna be a break at 4.30 for a closed session item. Um, we will have our regular session, uh, uh, clo uh, oral communications at 5.30. And oral communications is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on any items that are not on today's agenda. Oral communications generally occur at the conclusion or afternoon of business at around 5.30 p.m., but may occur before that time. Um, please note, council members, again, will be adjourning the, the regular session at 4.30 p.m. for the closed session, and we'll come back at 5.30 from closed session to hear oral communications. Now I'd like to ask the city attorney if there's any report out on the closed session. 
Yes, thank you, Mayor Trazas, members of the City Council. Uh, this afternoon's very brief closed session uh, began at 1.45 in the uh, courtyard conference room with uh, okay. one category of uh, business to discuss, and that was um, liability claims. The claims of Irene Bush, James E. Lewis, and Harlan D. Graves. And those um, claims are also listed as agenda item nine on your consent agenda. And there was no reportable action. Thank you. And is there a report from the city manager? Uh, yes, thank you, Mayor. Just a couple of things. First, I wanted to let the council know that uh, Electrify America, uh, uh, who announced its next uh, $200 million investment in zero emissions vehicle infrastructure in California, they've, uh, according to their plan, the Santa Cruz, Watsonville, Metro Rail will see up to three DC fast chargers installed along the uh, uh, our corridor here as well as other investments. Um, and the the result of this is because of the city's uh, effort to submit two proposals um, uh, on behalf of a local team here. And so we're very pleased that they're gonna be investing in, in the city and or in the region. And of course, this helps to support our uh, climate action milestones, one of which is to reduce the uh, number of uh, or carbon emissions from vehicles uh, by 20%. Uh, and so uh, obviously this is a good thing for the city uh, to receive this amount of funding. And then secondly, I wanted to just to turn it over to Bonnie who's gonna introduce uh, Chip and the new uh, downtown ambassador program. So you get to, to meet some of the, the new folks on this new program. Thank you, Martin. Good afternoon, um, Mayor and members of the City Council. I just briefly um, want to, um, you all know Chip, so I don't need to introduce Chip, but I briefly just wanted to provide a little bit of context to the downtown ambassadors, because a lot of this work has been happening through the Downtown Management Corporation, and so I just wanted to provide a little bit of context. Many of you will remember uh, the host program that we used to have for many years in the downtown. Um, that program was jointly run by the city through the Downtown Management Corporation, and a much beloved uh, Gina uh, Ramirez, who uh, retired um, from running the business. In fact, we actually helped her set up her first business to run that for a number of years. After she left, um, we looked at alternatives um, downtown to continue sort of that host program. There are a number of organizations, businesses are out there, but for the funding that we had available, we couldn't actually make it work. So we started a pilot program with the Rangers, really putting on the Rangers a, a, a lot, which was to do the host uh, services as well as some of the enforcement downtown. So we tried that for two years. Um, I think they did a really good job, but as the DMC board, we de decided that we really wanted to bring back uh, an element that uh, was really focused on customer service, providing a friendly downtown experience um, back to the downtown. And so through the Downtown Management Corporation, um, we now have, and I'm presenting to you today, the Downtown Ambassadors. And so um, this is a sort of a joint program. It's, it's actually will be administered by the Downtown Management Corporation, but it's a contract with the Downtown Association. And so that's how we're actually able to financially make this work. Um, but it is a, a joint program, and I just wanted to assure you that the Downtown Rangers will continue in the downtown. Um, so this will be a whole team effort, um, including the downtown outreach workers as well. Um, so uh, with that, I will turn it over to Chip. Thank you, Bonnie. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Mayor Trazes, City Council members. I am Chip, I'm the executive of the Downtown Association and uh, Bonnie covered a bit. We're gonna go through a really quick presentation and give you an update on our ambassador program uh, that we launched a week ago yesterday in the downtown. And we can go ahead and, um, and this is, as Bonnie mentioned, it really is a partnership in, in every sense of the word. It's a partnership with the City of Santa Cruz, the Downtown Association and the Downtown Management Corporation. And, um, this is our mission, this is important, I want you guys to, to know this, it's our mission for the program's mission is to be the best part of people's day in downtown Santa Cruz. Uh, and Sonia, who I'm gonna introduce in a moment, is gonna talk about how we're doing that. Uh, go ahead. Um, and uh, Bonnie covered a, a bit of this, but we were able to launch this quarter with some support from the Economic Development Department beginning uh, January 1st of 2019. The program will be funded by an existing assessment of property through the Downtown Management Corporation and uh, many costs. There, There is some leverage for some cost and overhead since the Downtown Association is running the 
the program and shared staffing and shared office space and some other office, uh, some other costs that we're able to to minimize. Uh, thank you. So our goals. Um, among our goals, we're, we're hoping to improve the perceived public experience of downtown Santa Cruz, um, add value and perceived value to the district, and improve the support in responsiveness to the businesses, or the perceived support and responsiveness to the businesses, and also strengthen the downtown community. I'm going into a little bit of how we're achieving those goals, but I want to introduce our director of operations who's uh, managing the day-to-day -day of this program and who I believe you all know, um, Sonia Brunner. Thank you. Good afternoon, council members. Uh, Sonia Brunner, Director of Operations with the Downtown Association. And it's my pleasure to introduce two of our five ambassadors, Meg Valema and Michelle Otanis. These are both of our full-time ambassadors. So each of them working uh, the Sunday through Wednesday and then the other half of the week. And um, basically, just to give you an overview of the program, the ambassadors will be proactively looking for visitors who might need assistance, whether it's finding change, uh, where's the change machine or whatever it is they're looking for a specific place or directions to the beach. <laughs> um, proactively communicating with downtown businesses and their staff. A lot of businesses have um, already found them very helpful. Identify, report, and resolve vandalism, graffiti, waste, debris, and cleanliness issues. So just kind of doing their part also to pick, pick up trash, light trash that's on the ground, um, and do public safety reporting. Uh, also to observe and report criminal behavior and any other public safety issues. Um, they will liaison with the relevant city staff and other downtown partners, such as Uncle Poop, and uh, the kiosk staff and the rangers, the police, the park workers, the outreach worker, the homeless outreach worker, uh, uh, and so on. They will also track reoccurring issues and work with partners to problem solve and continually look for new ways on how to help improve each block. And um, if you have any questions for them, I think afterwards we will open that. That's my nutshell. <laughs> um, and I want to also let you guys know about a um, community app we launched uh, in concurrent with launching this program. Uh, we, we found this app, which we initially researched for the ambassadors to keep track of the activity they're doing on the street. And then we've made the app available to the business community downtown and residents and anybody else who would like to use it. It's a great app that the... <laughs> Uh, downtown community can use to contact the ambassadors. We also have buttons to reach the rangers, the emergency uh, dispatch and non-emergency, the homeless outreach. It's uh, a great way so you don't have to keep track of all those numbers or who to call, it's right there. It's also linked to the city's new reporting uh, app, the CRISP app, and it also um, gives people the ability to report downtown specific issues. Uh, I'll give you a quick couple of examples of things we've heard, already gotten this week. Um, and there's a post from one of our downtown businesses who is very excited. Um, I have to say, going back to the, the, the partnership of this, um, all of the things that Sonia listed that the ambassadors are doing, obviously they're not doing on their own and we can't do without the city's support. And the responsiveness of the city staff already this week has been uh, outstanding, extraordinary. This was... Uh, uh, a business reported this uh, cobwebs on the lamppost, which is something not a lot of people look up, so you don't always see that. And Rich Smith from uh, the city was out there the next day and cleaned them up, and we're getting the block cleaned up. Um, so we've gotten a number of, um, this was day one of the program. We got a report of some trash in an alley uh, behind Santa Cruz, and uh, that was uh, reported. I've towards the end of the day on October 1st and on my, I took the second picture on my way into work and I didn't come in that late. So it, it's, uh, the response has been really wonderful and very quickly, quick. So happy to answer questions. We're very excited about the program and having the extra presence downtown to just support the community in downtown and happy to answer any questions for, for any of us. Any questions? Sandy? Sandy. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, I, 
If you don't mind, I wouldn't, I'd wouldn't. i like to hear from the ambassadors, those who are actually getting out on the street, just to your thought, your initial thoughts on the experience. Well, good afternoon. I'm Michelle Otanes, and I want to say thank you. I'm thrilled about this new program. It is a whole new world for me, and I'm loving every minute of it. Being out there, helping the people, cleaning up, just being there in a good presence. A smile can change around someone's day. And I'm just enjoying it, learning a lot. And again, I'm grateful. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Meg. And also, thank you very much for having us here. Um, I would have to say what I think of what we do each day is see a need, fill a need um, mm -hmm. across the board from businesses to um, interacting with some of the homeless that are out there and um, just bringing a smile to people's face in any way we know. Great. Uh, Chris? I'm really excited you're here, too. I heard a lot about the downtown hosts, and people missed it, and you know, it's going to be all totally different, but, you know, it's going to really be helpful. Um, Meg, quick question, put you on the spot here. Uh, undergrad from New York arrives, looking around, comes over to you and goes, he's, he's, from, he's from the city, he's from Brooklyn, actually, and he says, so you only get one, one shot at this. Where, where's the best place to get pizza in downtown? The best place to get pizza? Yeah, what do you say? To a New York. Uh, I would probably send you over to Joe's. Thank you. Oh, wow. I love it. You should turn it back on him and ask. <laughs> All right, um, I'll, I'll just have to say if there's any other comments or questions, but um, for me, yeah, Councilmember Matthews. Um, I will just say, as a member of the Downtown Management Corporation Board with Rochelle, um, this to me has been a really positive part of the ongoing evolution of the downtown host in its many iterations program. Uh, it is funded by a, an assessment on property owners. It's important that it be responsive to the interests of the property owners and by extension the businesses downtown. <laughs> and um, I've served on a whole lot of boards in my day, and it's really, um, it's a pleasure to serve on a board that's constructive and does its critical thinking and looks of ways to, to continually improve the services that they provide. And we are excited about this new partnership, this new contract. Um, so that's the report. It, it was a, 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 a great discussion at the board level and one that has been unanimously embraced. I think it's really important for people to understand that um, we are not, you know, you're not out there to take the place of the police officers and the rangers that are patrolling, because that was the question a lot of people came to me and asked and said, well, wait a minute, you're, you know, you're not uh, replacing our, our police presence with downtown ambassadors. And I said, absolutely not. That's not the case. You are performing a function that is much different than what law enforcement is performing. And uh, I think it's really important the community know that. Thank you for bringing that up. If I can just add on to that, I think this program really can't be successful without all of the other resources that are in place. The Rangers do a tremendous job of enforcement, and we're really looking forward to working more closely with them and helping um, not only the enforcement, but the homeless outreach workers, the sidewalk cleaners, and everybody who is working downtown helping to, to be more more efficient because we have eyes and ears and we can really help help everyone who's working, but we can't do it without any of the existing resources that, that the city provides and, and the other agencies provide. And I'm just curious, have you had your ambassadors out at a time when you, were you out there when UC Santa Cruz came back into session this year? That would have been UCSC? like no. the first weekend or the last weekend in September or when UCSC came I was in. just curious because I was curious if you noticed an uptick in the number of people needing your assistance and asking questions, if we've had that experience yet with the students. Or if you get questions from the yes. students. It's, it's starting out. Well, I'm putting you on. Okay. Um, <laughs> yes, you can. <laughs> Boo. Um, both. I believe there is a more, um, a lot more UCSC students out there. Um, for instance, this morning there was a group of them, um, um, four out of the five were smoking, and I had to kindly ask them, you know, to put it out and please take their butts with them. And just then, Chuck was with me, and we engaged them where they're from, and you know, welcomed them to have a happy day and welcomed them here. And just it, it ended up peacefully. They were sorry; they didn't know. 
Yeah, so it's just a matter of just common courtesy and just, you know, instructing it. So, you know, make the rules aware. Um. Great. Uh, great. Okay, I, I'd just like to say I, I, it's it's wonderful to see you downtown as often as I do. I mean, having the visibility and so not just the friendly smiles, but also the additional eyes on the street to see when there's things that need help or how we connect the city to make sure that we're keeping it, you know, clean and vibrant downtown. It really makes a difference. I, I get copied on those C click fix uh, notices and it's really Damn, nice to see that, you know, the responsiveness that happens when when those uh, reports are made. So I really want to thank you and I look forward to seeing you downtown. Thank you very much. <laughs> Go ahead. I wanted to add that uh, they will be out there. The program is seven days a week, Monday through Sunday and 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. are the hours um, that they are out on Pacific Avenue and the side streets uh, from Laurel Street to Water Street. And um, we have lots more information on our website, downtownsantacruz.com slash ambassadors. Easy to download, I just did. Great. <laughs> hey, thanks, thanks Sonia, Chip, and, and again, thank you for the presentation. Thank, thank you. you. In closing, let me just, just say the, the program's a week old and we really want feedback. We wanna make this really work. For, so uh, get to know the ambassadors, get to know the, the, uh, um, the program and shameless plug. They will all be at the downtown party this Friday <laughs> at 6 p.m. If you wanna come by, there are some still some tickets. We're having a really fun, our second annual downtown party. So you can come uh, talk to the ambassadors then. Thank you so much. All right, and do we get pie now? Is that? <laughs> come back, uh, <laughs> come back, back. come back. Yeah. Thank you all. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, first up is there's no comment on the presentation, but uh, I mean, okay, we have yeah, I just wanted to um, note that uh, the okay, University sir. of California Law School Public Clinic released a 46 page sir, study. You're Tuesday out of order. Hey, I need you to sit down, sir. Alleging that business improvement districts in California, hey, you, including those in San Francisco, <laughs> habitually harass the homeless. The study also suggests that the BID political spending okay, violates state law. Okay, I turned the mic. Law. This is it's, a um, well, we just we've already had that item. 19th article in the San Francisco Thank Weekly. Thank you. Thought, Thank you. Uh, there's First up is a consent agenda. These are items three through 13 on our agenda. All items will be acted upon in one motion unless an item is pulled from a council member by a council member for further discussion. Are there any council members who wish to pull any items from the consent agenda? Council member Brown. Uh, well, I just have a comment on item eight and I'd like to pull item 13 for brief conversation. Mm -hmm. Councilmember Matthews. Um, I would actually like to pull eight for a rather minor comment and adjustment, hopefully, and um, have a brief comment on 10. Doesn't need to be pulled. 10. Yeah, I was gonna make a comment on 10. Right. Okay, so eight, you have the comment, so we're gonna pull it anyways, and so we'll have that. Um, Councilmember Crone. Um, just a, uh, a comment on six and a question on 10. Okay, do you want a, uh, a question or we're, we're just gonna have comments? You want, would you like 10 pulled for that question? Is it a comment or, I mean? It, it, it's more, you know, wanting to know where the fire truck is going. Who's, what happens to it? The okay, old, I'm gonna the pull, fire truck. I think I'm gonna pull 10 for the question just so we do that and then also cover it. So um, the items that have been uh, pulled are eight, 10 and 13 with uh, a comment on item six. And that was uh, the comment on six. Is that correct? Who had yeah. a comment on six? Yeah. Okay. Um, are there any members of the public that wish to speak to any item on the agenda with the uh, consent agenda with the exception of eight, 10, or 13? Anyone? Six. Six is a, just a comment. Eight, 10, or 13? Okay. Seeing none, I'll bring it back to, to the council. Um, Move or to motion. Uh, motion to approve um, everything except eight, ten, and thirteen. 
Second. Okay. We have motion by Council Member Naroyan, second by Council Member Brown. Um, any further discussion? Um, now, before we do the vote, um, you had a uh, comment on six? Yeah, I just wanted to say um, this is part of the uh, continued extortion from cell phone companies, and we fought it off one time before. It's called the Streamline Act. I call it the Steamroller Act, because it's steamroll, trying to steamroller over cities' rights. And I appreciate the mayor putting this on. I appreciate the uh, League of Cities bringing it to our attention. And um, let's keep up the good fight. All right, great. Okay, so we have a motion and a second. I Go ahead, have Council. To, I could not agree more. I just had to put that in because I find this so offensive. Great, thank you. Okay, so we have a, um, a, um, a motion by Council Member Naroyan, second by Council Member Brown. Um, this is a consent agenda with the exception of items 8, 10, and 13. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Mm -hmm. Who's opposed? That motion passes unanimously with Council Member Chase absent. So now we'll start with item number eight. And Council Member uh, Matthews, you had uh, the question on this. Yes, um, I really appreciate the work of the um, Council Ad Hoc Budget Committee and um, the brief report that they submitted. Um, I did notice that one component remains to be brought back to us, the um, budgetary policy and principles for 2020. And we are, I, I talked with the finance um, director about this. Um, that's to come back to us. It's, it's pretty well formed already. Um, is to come back to us in November. Um, but I did want to add, uh, include in the motion, just to be specific, and I should say also, I understand that the budget principles do include the assumption of forecasting. Um, but I would like to add, in addition to the motion as it's presented, that we request that the budgetary policy and principles for 2020, which are still to be completed, include specific consideration of contract negotiations in the coming year. So makes it, sense. It's a very simple yeah. addition. Sure. Yeah, sure. I'll second. Is that a motion? Yeah. I'll second. Okay, motion by Council Member uh, Matthews, second by Vice Mayor Watkins. Is there any member of the public that would like to speak to this item? Um, this is the Council Ad Hoc Budget Committee. Okay, seeing none, I'll bring it back to the Council for further direction. We have a motion on the floor from, from Council Member Matthews and Vice Mayor Watkins, and you also had a comment. I just have a quick comment. Uh, so I appreciate getting this, uh, the re final report here, and uh, we will be getting the, um, the principles for, uh, I guess, our November agenda, so that's good. Um, I just wanted to say that, you know, being involved in this process was uh, really um, gratifying for me because I think that we did, uh, you know, we did a lot of work uh, in the subcommittee and with staff to try to streamline the process, and I think that worked really well. So I'm looking forward to continuing to do that. Um, and I noticed that the agenda report came from staff, but I just wanted to say that I know in our, our conversations in the subcommittee, we were very much supportive of moving this forward so um, that our names weren't officially on the agenda report, but we had all decided that this was a really great way to move forward. So just wanted to make sure that was clear. And thanks for everyone for uh, your work. <laughs> Marcus Pimentel, your finance director, and that report is, is from the Budget Act H H Committee. I'll, I'll take care on that. It's just uh, when we were getting into the system. But uh, what I really wanted to say is I really uh, commend the committee. They did some amazing work in a very short period of time, a lot of work, a lot of lifting, a lot of community outreach, a lot of real thoughtfulness, and I'm really proud of, of the product of it. And, and I appreciate all the work on the budgetary principles, and they're almost, I mean, I think they're effectively ready to go, and be happy to bring those back to you. Yeah, I'll say that I, I was really happy to, to, to work together with um, Vice Mayor Watkins and Council Member Brown. I thought it was great. It started a new process in terms of community engagement on the budget and then also getting some external uh, reports from outside um, you know, agencies to look at what how we're benchmarking against them in terms of where we are in terms of staffing, where we are in budget costs. It was really helpful, I think, to kind of do those comparisons. And I hope those continue. I mean, I hope we start to even look at how the group that helped us last time maybe is engaged and expanding or have some new new people involved as well to provide different perspectives. And thank you, if I just remembered, as you mentioned it, uh, that was, I think, one of the most exciting uh, elements of the process was having a focus group where we invited people from the community to participate in uh, uh, some discussion at the front end. And I hope that those of you in the audience and others listening um, follow us and, and wanna um, perhaps get involved in future focus groups, because I think that is really important uh, um, outside uh, <coughs> look at the budget for us. 
I'll just briefly say thank you so much. Also, it was a, it was a great experience and I appreciated the process. And I also just really want to acknowledge Marcus and his staff and Tracy for all their work. It was a really busy time and really pulling this together in a really comprehensive way was, was really beneficial to all of us, I'd say. So thank you and I look forward to continuing it next yeah. year. And if um, Councilmember Matthews, you restate that motion, please. I pre um, I, while you're getting that, Councilmember Crone. Just a question, when is the person going to be appointed to this uh, subcommittee? Uh, next week. Monday. Thank you. I'll read the whole thing. Yeah. It, it's just one addition to the existing motion. Motion to form a FY 2020 City Council Ad Hoc Budget Committee. Appoint prior committee members, Vice Mayor Watkins and Council Member Brown with one additional mayor appointee. Receive a report on FY 2019 Ad Hoc Budget Committee and request that the budgetary policy and principles for 2020 still to be completed include specific consideration of contract negotiations in the coming year. Okay, is that clear? Mm -hmm. And that's, Second. and you seconded that motion on Vice Mayor Watkins. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion passes unanimously. Okay, next up is with item- With Council Member Chase Absent. With Council Member Chase Absent, thank you. Uh, the next item was uh, item number 10, and um, really this was, you had a question, Council Member Crone, but before you do that, um, I was gonna just pr be prepared to make a comment and say how timely it was to have this particular item come before us, to have new resources in the field to address our fire danger. And so um, I think that having it before us now as a consent item was something where it was very routine, but it, um, it was it warranted maybe if you had some additional uh, comments you wanted to make about how this resource will help us um, and address Council Member Crone's question on that where the where the vehicle will be located was that the the question? No, where the old vehicle will where be the going? Old, where the old vehicle will be going? It's part of your uh, just brief response. Yeah, the old vehicle will be surplused. Um, we don't have uh, current capacity within our existing stations to keep that number of vehicles, um, and it's outlived its uh, useful lifespan. It's 17 years old, it's two wheel drive, it doesn't have the modern uh, equipment and safety features on it as far as uh, suspension, uh, seat belts, uh, and, and the pumping. Uh, it's a really unique piece of equipment in the sense that um, it's a short wheelbase, um, it's four wheel drive, and unlike our other engines that once you get to a place where we need to pump water, you have to um, uh, divert the energy or the power from the motor to the pump. Uh, these type three engines have the ability to what we call pump and roll. And so in an area like Poganep or in Rana Gulch or Grassy Field, you can actually drive while someone is falling with a hose line and um, putting water on, the, on a grass fire. And so it's a mobile, uh, what we call mobile attack. Um, and in a lot of our areas in Poganep and uh, Rana Gulch and, and De La Viega, we can't get our larger engines into those areas as readily or as safely. Um, so we're really appreciative that uh, Measure S is finally come to, coming to fruition. I believe that this is the first funds that have been used for Measure S uh, uh, for something for the city. Uh, we're, we're really looking forward to it. Uh, we were able to tag on to other purchases that were being made in, this, in the uh, U.S as well as um, uh, purchases within the county. So there's a number of our adjoining agencies that are purchasing the same model, the same um, equipment. And so we have that interoperability uh, when we uh, re receive mutual aid and give mutual aid. Great. And the, 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 the money is coming out of the general fund, just to make that clear, yeah. And just a side question, uh, the Mission Hill fire, would you have been able to use a, new, a truck like this for that? Would that have been any useful? Um, absolutely. Um, that, that area, uh, we didn't need to use it for that, um, but uh, for that area to access along the railroad tracks, that type of equipment is a much better piece of equipment than what we currently have in what we call our Type 1 engines, which is what um, you see driving around normally. Okay, okay. Uh, Council Member Matthews. Well, not only is wildland fire response uh, at the top of everyone's minds these days. But um, I did want to comment also that um, this is a result of Measure S. People say, what are we getting for our quarter cent sales tax increase? And we promised the public that this would be in that first package, and it is. So I hope there's a big splash when it arrives. I know that's about a 10 month wait, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, going to be ordered. Once we order it, it has to be built. We'll, there'll be a number of site visits. Uh, we expect it to be in use um, next fire season, which is kind of a relative term with, our, uh, um. with, with what we've had in California. Fire season used to be a few months, and now it's uh, kind of spread out over a calendar year. Thank you, and also just wanted to say, uh, as we brought Measure S forward as a supplement to the general fund, um, this is a capital expenditure 
it doesn't all go to operating. And I think this highlights the need to uh, reinvest in our capital resources. And I think the fire department had been asking this for four years or so, it, it was outdated. And, and finally, it's a half a million dollar product basically. So we're, we're fortunate to be able to take that measure S money and, and really invest in something important to the community. Yeah, thank you. I greatly appreciate it. And yeah. like you said, it's a, it's a big investment and it'll get put to, to good use. Councilmember Royan. And I just want to say, I, before I was on council, I was on Public Works and Transportation Commission for six years. And I think I've heard about this fire truck every one of those six years I was on the commission <laughs> before being elected to council. So I'm really good. I'm really glad that we're here today talking about the acquisition of this really important piece of equipment. And I have to say those fires on Mission Hill uh, have been very close to my home. One evening, um, opening the front door and seeing flames and a fire truck in front of my house was very unnerving. And so um, I'm really happy that this piece of equipment is here. And I just have to say the effort that I've seen the fire department um, in chasing after what's been going on around town with, with all of these little fires has been pretty amazing. You guys have been doing great work uh, keeping the public safe, so thank you. Councilmember Brown. Since everyone's commenting cheerfully about uh, this acquisition, I'll uh, just uh, chime in. I am really pleased that this is happening. It's one of the first things I heard about when I uh, did a ride along uh, early on in uh, during my, this term on the council. And I remember um, Chief Frawley at the time suggesting that uh, this is a resource that can also be shared with other uh, fire jurisdictions that maybe don't have access to this kind of equipment. And so, um, you know, it, the benefits will be regional, really. And um, in addition, that we may recoup some of the cost of the investment through that. Yeah, and, and so what you're, what you're seeing, it's not just a regional approach with our neighbors. We have the same equipment, so we have that interoperability. It's also part of the Master Mutual Aid Plan that we have within California. Um, and just last night, we um, had a strike team come back from out of county that was part of the Office of Emergency Services where because of the high flag or the high wind red flag danger, they pre-positioned resources um, in Contra Costa County and that team actually responded to the fire that was south of Travis Air Force Base, which made our air quality so poor. Mm -hmm. um, so they, it's, um, we're part of that plan. We receive the aid when we need it. We give it when we can. Um, and yeah, it, it's a very much a regional resource. All right, thank you. So at this point, I'd like to ask if there's any members of the public that would like to speak to this item. This is item number 10. It's the uh, wild uh, land fire engine purchase. Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the council. Council Mayor, uh, Vice Mayor Watkins. I'll just move the recommendation and sort of echo the comments that were previously made. Thank you for um, making our community safe in terms of what we know is coming and all the risks that we have. And it's nice to see our Measure S dollars go to this cause. So thank I'll you. second that. Yeah, I think this is something that's extremely important and timely that we have it, and I'm really excited that it's happening. So all those in favor of the motion, uh, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? Aye. Passes unanimously with Council Member Chase absent. So the next item on the agenda is item number 13. This is the professional services contract for aquifer storage and recovery. Afternoon. So there was a question, I, I think. Yeah. Well, I want to, I guess I want to preface that with a comment. At, um, so uh, this is an item that uh, is, you know, we're, we're being asked to approve another service, another consultant service contract. But I think it's worth noting that it's, uh, and this item is actually much more important than um, simply approving that contract. And, um, you know, I think that it's it's just worth noting because the a lot of this work happens uh, almost all of it behind the scenes. We, as council members, uh, are um, unable to digest all of the material that, you know, and the technical work that is done. Um, but we obviously have uh, great faith in the water department and our water commission to have a, take a closer look at that. So I just wanted to say that and, um, you know, just remind us that this aquifer storage and recovery uh, project is one of the four potential water supply uh, projects that um, that could fill our uh, existing water demand gap. And um, finding that the project may be feasible based on the phase one work and moving on to phase two is kind of an important achievement. I just want to say that. So um, uh, thank you for all of the work that uh, you and your staff do. Um, and it also raises a question for me because I know the Water Commission 
is generally, uh, you know, they focus more on this. And, um, you know, I, so I just wanted to raise a question and maybe not for discussion today, but just um, ask the council to consider what kind of role we want our water commission to play. And, and I, cause I kind of feel like we don't hear a lot directly from them. We have our annual meeting, but we don't really engage with them short of, you know, individual commissioners that we may know, or if they reach out to us, I certainly don't. Um, follow all of the agendas and come to all the meetings, but I, I just think it's something that w is worth thinking about and perhaps revisiting at some time in the future. Um, and so, just want, I just want to say this is really kind of, this is a big deal. <laughs> yeah. So um, let's uh, be happy to be moving on to phase two. Could I just add a couple of comments there? Um, so the um, council member Brown is totally right. This is a it's a big sort of watershed moment for us to move forward uh, into looking at actually putting water from available supplies that will be, uh, you know, surface water supplies, putting that into the ground. It's one of the key items that is, uh, we're evaluating as part of the Water Supply Advisory Committee recommendations that we'll be coming back to council for some kind of a discussion and hopefully decision on supplemental supply uh, in 2020, so it's not too far away. The other really important part of this same kind of strategy is uh, this is the year we're probably going to do water transfers with the Soquel Creek Water District as part of looking at that uh, in lieu service as a potential uh, opportunity to again do a regional strategy for conjunctive use of surface water and groundwater. Um, so we've done a lot of studies and a lot of work to get here and now we're gonna see if it really works. So it's pretty exciting and we're pretty enthusiastic about moving forward with this step. We're, gonna, we're still looking for a site to do this in the Santa Margarita Basin. Um, and Council Member Brown is also correct. We had a very thorough discussion of this at the Water Commission last Monday night. And uh, the, the uh, report was already in process, and, but we were, um, the Water Commission did take an action to recommend the approval of this to you very specifically, but the report was already down the pipeline, so it wasn't able, uh, we weren't able to change it, but I'm glad to have the opportunity to pass on that recommendation. Are there any other questions? Council I just wanted to um, support, add to what uh, Councilmember Brown said. I, I, I do think this uh, the phase one analysis, moving to phase two, is is, is quite a quite an accomplishment, and, and I'm I'm really happy. This is one of our four uh, sources of water, right? So, moving forward, I, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Welcome. Are there any members of the public that would like to speak to this item? This is item number thirteen regarding the professional service contract for aquifer storage and recovery pilot test program. I'd like to bring it back to council for action. Council yeah. Member Matthews. I'm happy to go ahead and move the recommendation and just uh, express thanks to both the water department staff and the commission whose all the background work on this is so thorough and the commission does do exceptional work in vetting, discussing these issues before they come to us. Is, okay, so second? Second. Okay. Council, uh, Council Member Matthews and Council Member Brown with a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion passes unanimously with Council Member Chase absent. Okay, this brings us up to um, the next item on the agenda, which are public hearings. Um, the first item is our 2018 engineering and traffic um, survey, and this is uh, James Burr, the transportation manager. Uh, good afternoon. I'm here to talk about the uh, item number 14, the 2018 Engineering and Traffic Survey. Uh, I have both a resolution and a ordinance change in front of you today. The resolution would certify the 2018 survey and the ordinance would uh, back it up and also reduce the speeds on three streets, street segments, that's Delaware Avenue, Isbell, and Western Drive. The uh, engineering traffic survey is a document required by the California Vehicle Code to establish and post speed limits on streets. Um, it also provides a legal backing to use radar enforcement on those same streets. Uh, this action was uh, heard and approved at the September 17th meeting of the Transportation Public Works Commission. And if approved today, staff will publish the document and then provide it to law enforcement, of course, and then the uh, Santa Cruz County Law Library and the uh, Superior Court Traffic Division. 
the survey would be valid for seven years and um, would replace the last one that was done in 2011. Again, the only change between the last one and this next one is are the street, three streets that would be reduced to 25 miles an hour. Uh, the streets that are included in the survey are mapped, uh, and that's part of your packet, on the California Road Systems map. Um, they define uh, which streets we have to uh, survey. Um, and it's basically because of the vehicle code uh, speed trap language. Um, they refer to the, to the map in your packet. And uh, any street on that map must have an ETS or you cannot use radar for enforcement. To ensure um, uniformity in how these streets are posted, when we post, when we go out and post speed limits, uh, we typically use the 85 percentile survey mode. Um, almost every state in the uh, nation and every city and every state uses that uh, methodology. You basically go out and survey uh, 100 cars. The 85th fastest car is the 85th percentile, and then you try to set the speed within five miles an hour of that speed. Um, you are allowed two reductions. You're allowed to round down if it's mathematically correct. So if somebody, if some, if a street is surveyed at 32 miles an hour, you could round down to 30, and then you're allowed one more reduction by five miles an hour. <coughs> Almost every street we were able to keep at 25. That was at 25. Again, the only changes were the three streets that were currently currently at 30. We're reducing back to 25. Um, the one other difference this time is that we added about 30 streets to the survey, uh, all of them at 25, just because the um, because the mapping seemed expanded this year. And so we met with PD and any street they thought they could use radar enforcement on, we went ahead and surveyed. Um, this uh, reflects hundreds of hours of staff time. We've been working on it for almost a year and a half uh, because you have to go out at non-peak times and survey try to survey 100 cars or at least 50 or 60 or however many you can get. Uh, and then log all that and bring it back. And we, of course, clean it up and put it in Excel. And um, then eventually we'll publish. Um, I think that's about it. I'm available for questions. Any questions? On the side. I actually do have yeah, one. Okay, good. We'll, we'll start Councilmember Crown and Councilmember Matthews. Thank you. Uh, thank you for responding to the email, too. I was just wondering. Um, when you just said 100 cars, and that, but you don't survey 100 cars, you only do 50 or 60. You, you gave an example of the 85th percentile, the 85th car, and so you just take it, the math back, if you only get 60 cars? Correct. Yeah. And is there no street where we have it above 30 in, in, in our city? Above 30 miles above an hour? 30 miles an hour? Um, Non-state highway? Right. There are none. There are none. And would... Uh, I think the neighbors would probably be happy this goes back to 25 in these, um, on these streets. These are great locations for that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Qu Councilmember Matthews. Well, I can just remember so many times people say, please reduce the speed limit, and then we have to explain the 85th percentile and all the legal constraints, et cetera, for enforcement. So I'm delighted we're actually going down. How did that happen? Well, if, if you look at the speeds across years of the surveys, and uh, we have them going back for... I don't know, 30 years. Uh, they used to be done every five years. The speeds actually on streets are pretty darn consistent. Mm -hmm. But if you get even a slight variation, like these three streets went from either 33 where I had to round up mm. to 32. And so I could round down and then reduce by five. Well, it's anyway, just a slight variance. Welcome news to yep, very, people. Yeah. Yes, so um, thank you. And, and just the fact that you the department proactively went out and measured a whole lot more streets that weren't required. That's very responsive to community concerns without making a big fanfare out of it. So good, good for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah uh, Councilmember Matthew or Naroyan. 
I just wanted to make a comment. Um, I unfortunately became really familiar with how speeds are set uh, when I worked for the state legislature and um, just want to say thank you for your work in this because it's incredibly dense and detailed, um, the regulations that we have to follow that the state has. And they do this because I guess towns were notorious for having speed traps and that being a great way to raise revenue for their city. So um, thank you for hanging in there and thanks for doing the survey so we could actually do radar enforcement of speed limits along what have become speedway, well, have always been speedways. Western Drive, I grew up right off of Western Drive, and even when it was like off-roading, because the road was in such a bad condition back in the 70s and 80s, um, people still drove pretty fast. So thanks for working through all the dense state uh, regulation on this. I couldn't agree more. I mean, having it go down is a really big deal, and I think it's thankful. I mean, it gives the, the um, Santa Cruz Police Department some more opportunities. I just wanted to ask um, uh, the Public Works if there's ways when we look at areas where there's been high accident rates or there's issues of you know traffic safety, whether there's any discretion to incorporate that into your review of speed limits. There is discretion for uh, high accident rates. However, um, I didn't need to use that. You can, and the reason I included so much documentation with the staff report today is because there's very little wiggle room when setting speeds and especially in reducing speeds. So in in every case possible, I was bring, able to bring it back to 25 without using the collision history. That's not, that wasn't really necessary. So you can reduce it for other reasons, like bicycle safety and residential density. And there's a variety of reasons, um, even without the collisions. And that was performed. Okay, great, thank you. Um, are there any members of the public that wish to speak to this item? This is item number 14, the 2018 Engineering and Traffic Survey. Any members of the public would like to speak to this item? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the Council for Action. Council Member Matthews. I'd like to move approval. I'll, I'll second. Okay, I'll give it to Vice Mayor Watkins. Um, all those in favor, um, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously with Council Member Chase absent. Okay, the next item is item number 15. This is um, a public hearing regarding the second reading and final adoption of ordinance number 2018-13 amended sections of S S Title 24 of the Santa Cruz Municipal Code. Um, this is uh, Carol Berg um, from the Housing and Community Development uh, Manager. She's uh, up on this item for a presentation. Or Lee Butler, Director of Planning. <laughs> Good afternoon, Council. Lee Butler, Planning Director. And we don't have a formal presentation for you this afternoon. Uh, this is the second reading. Last week we spoke, or excuse me, two weeks ago we spoke about a series of uh, proposed changes, uh, most notably uh, the changes to um, the mapped rentals and the, uh, so requiring inclusionary for <coughs> rental units during the um, portion of time uh, when, or excuse me, of uh, for sale units during the portion of time when they're rented. Um, also, there were some changes to the inclusionary percentage for rental units outside of the downtown going from 15% to 10%. And uh, then some changes to uh, some formulas, for example, um, looking at 35% uh, of household income as uh, the uh, threshold for using um, the, or for setting the rent levels rather than 40% where we're currently at. Um, so there were a series of changes, uh, a, a very robust discussion and we're available for any questions that you may have. Right, before we go into questions, I'd like to first ask if there's any members of the public that would like to speak to this item. This is item 15, it's the second reading and final adoption of ordinance number 2018-13, amending um, title 24 of the municipal code. Any members of the public? All right, seeing none, I'll bring it back to the council for uh, further questions, discussion, and action. Anyone? Council Member Crone. Yeah, I just, uh, I, I didn't realize there was a, is there a difference? This is, we had the email about the downtown, what does it make downtown? And downtown development area is different than downtown or that's downtown? And how is that like determined? Because I might've missed this. I, I missed it in our discussion last time. But I, I just, I've been asked by a few people because you see that big, huge River Street sign that some of us love and uh, says, down, welcome to downtown Santa Cruz. You know, so some of my undergraduate and their families think that that's where downtown Santa Cruz is right there, that it's River Street. Um, but how did this, 
how do those streets happen? That it's that that's what downtown is. Sure. So I'll start by um, just identifying the downtown area. Um, it's bounded by Water Street to the north, San Lorenzo River to the east, uh, Laurel Street to the south, and Cedar Street to the west. And really, that distinction came about as part of the pro forma analysis. Um, that's an area where higher intensity uses are um, are promoted through our downtown plan, and so um, that is an area where um, because of the densities and because of the ability to use the um, state density bonus to uh, the benefit of those projects, both in terms, well, in large part in terms of the uh, parking reductions, um, but also in that um, those densities will also require structured parking versus outside of that area. The densities will oftentimes um, uh, mean that uh, surface parking options will be used in lieu of the structured parking. So really it's just a function of the densities. Um, in that area, there are higher densities and that has a, an alternative pro forma analysis. And so that was where it was separated out, those densities versus outside of those areas. Thanks. Okay, any other questions? But th th I'm just, there's no historic sort of thing of like what downtown is. Uh, uh, how did the, those streets get to be chosen over other, extending it farther or shrinking it? I just was wondering if there's any history here on past planning commissions or planning departments using downtown as fungible. So I, I would definitely say that people have a, a different idea of downtown and and even, you know, Cedar Street to the west. Um, some would say that it extends further and some would say that it extends further north. I think for purposes of this, it's just where the uh, development intensities are the greatest um, in terms of the potential for development intensities. Um, and, you know, at, at some point in the future that, that may be considered um, as, as we uh, continue to grow. Um, looking at areas further north, as you mentioned, on River Street or further south. Um, you know, right now we have the beach and south of Laurel area plan, and um, that is separate from our downtown area plan. But at some point, you know, there, there may be um, opportunities to look at how those two um, interact together and promoting higher densities in those areas that are close to transit and services and jobs. Because someone remarked, sent me an email and said that the arena for them is da is downtown. That would make sense to put the arena in the downtown. But. The Warriors um, Stadium. Oh, yeah. um, any questions on this side? Okay, Councilmember Matthews. Um, I think a number of us may uh, want to ask a question about uh, correspondence we received, um, um, claiming that uh, the. Um, uh, this action would violate measure O, uh, it would um, reduce a legally binding 15% mandated affordable housing requirement, et cetera. And um, I did ask the city attorney to explain um, how this um, action would not violate what's on the, on the books already. Yes, thank you. Um, so, we're all on the same page. Measure O was adopted in 1979, and it, it addressed a bunch of it, several different topics, one of which was affordable housing, and it states, uh, it shall be the pos policy of the city of Santa Cruz that at least 15% of those housing units newly constructed for sale or rental each year shall be capable of purchase or rental by persons with average or below average incomes. And um, historically, this has been, in, in, and the county of Santa Cruz also has a similar requirement applicable in the county. Um, historically, this has always been interpreted as 15% of the total number of housing units constructed, not 15% uh, of those constructed on each parcel. And I think uh, in the staff report that you received at the last meeting, there was a discussion of the, the number of um, affordable units constructed in the city over the past 10 years or so relative to the number of market rate units and the 15% was um, was easily exceeded. So so that's how it's been interpreted. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, any uh, further <coughs> comments or action? Well, I'll move the rec, I mean, I'll, I'll move the second reading of the ordinance. And I appreciated Kaiser Marston coming and doing a presentation and helping us understand all of the history and all the work on this. And I know it's really complicated and and thick and a lot of uh, conversation ensued. And so, but I'm happy to move the second reading at this time. 
I'll check. Uh, okay, I'll go to Councilmember <laughs> Matthews with a second. Uh, Vice Mayor Watkins and uh, and Councilmember Matthews with a second. Uh, Councilmember Brown. Just, I think I've been pretty uh, clear and uh, ex expansive in my comments about this particular issue, so I'm going to make it brief. Uh, I do want to really thank staff for all of the work that you've done to bring us some changes that I do think will likely lead to additional affordable housing development in the city. I really appreciate that uh, and your responsiveness to concerns, answering questions. I know this has been a long process. Um, lamentably, I will be voting no. Um, were it not for the uh, change, that the motion that was made to, to increase the percentage income for affordability purposes for, for rents um, and the potential grandfathering of uh, many multi-unit structures that do not have open application planning applications, um, I might be able to support it. But um, given those uh, uh, concerns, I will be voting no. Thank you. Uh, um, Council Member Noroyan. I just want to express I had the same distress voting for something that um, lowers the inclusionary rate. Um, you know, I, I really teetered on that, but I think the financial report, um, you know, by the consultant just tipped me over into seeing, I guess, the reality of the situation. I hope, I would love to be proven wrong that um, that inclusionary rate doesn't have to be um, set down to 10%, and I would in a heartbeat raise it to 15, but um, yeah, I was really torn on that as well. We have a motion by Council Vice. Go ahead, Councilman Brown. I just want to clarify. I thank you for that. Um, it. I actually could have supported the 10 percent. It was the increase in the the income in percentage of income to be okay. spent on housing, and the potential grandfathering of n units so that even the 10 and 15 percent in the downtown may not apply for projects that are coming our way. So, but I just wanted to clarify that. For Thank you. Motion by Vice Mayor Watkins, second by Councilmember Matthews. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. 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 Any opposed? Sorry. That that, uh, no. that that passes with um, Councilmember Crone, Councilmember uh, Brown uh, saying no. Um, Councilmember Matthews, Councilmember Roy, and Vice Mayor uh, Watkins and myself, um, <laughs> yes. And uh, Councilmember Chase absent. The next item on the agenda is item number 16. This is the uh, resolution um, adopting the 2018 through 2023 local hazard mitigation plan and climate adaptation plan update. We're starting to get up into the big numbers of years, it seems like, 2023. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Tiffany Wise West, Sustainability and Climate Action Manager for our presentation. Thank you, Mayor. Let me, give me just a moment to bring up this presentation. Thank you for the binder and all the materials you provided in advance. You are quite welcome. All right. Um, <laughs> we'd actually like to start out with some uh, comments uh, from the emergency operations manager, Paul Horvat, on the local hazard mitigation plan to start. Okay, great. Thank you, Council. Paul Horvat, Santa Cruz Fire Department Emergency Operations Center Manager. Um, just would like to provide you with a quick update of what we're doing today. Um, we're uh, adopting the local hazard mitigation plan update. This is the third update of our local hazard mitigation plan, which started back in 2008. Um, Public Works uh, assisted with this update and uh, they were very helpful. Um, the local hazard mitigation plan is a plan where we go through the entire city and we analyze the risks that we, uh, that we face, uh, mostly with our infrastructure. We're looking at roads, bridges, culverts, um, water distribution and supply systems, wastewater treatment systems, um, et cetera. And um, based on that analysis, we rank our hazards within the city of Santa Cruz. And what I mean by that is we, we analyze those hazards and we assign a risk rating to determine which hazard is most significant to the city. And uh, we look at those hazards in terms of uh, natural disasters, earthquakes, fires, floods, et cetera, um, something that we are no strangers to here within the city of Santa Cruz. And then based on that analysis, we form game plans on um, what our attack is gonna be to try to improve, uh, 
improve the infrastructure here within the city of Santa Cruz. Um, this plan makes us eligible for federal <coughs> funding through FEMA. Uh, we have a couple of grant applications in the process already through the water department to improve our water supply systems that had been damaged during the uh, 2017 storms. And um, so that's good news for the city and we're gonna be very aggressive going after this grant funding, trying to uh, uh, improve some of the, the deficiencies that we have uh, discovered within our infrastructure. Um, so that's kind of the uh, local hazard mitigation plan in a nutshell. Um, Tiffany was very, very helpful and instrumental in assisting us with this, uh, the plan development and merging it with the uh, climate adaptation plan. Uh, the climate adaptation plan is an appendix to the local hazard mitigation plan. So that is my uh, brief update to your council. Thank you. Um, ask questions? Yeah, do you wanna go through the full presentation first and then you can ask questions or? Okay, I just had a specific question. Okay, please, go ahead. Okay. Sure. Um, so when you talk about the grants from FEMA for water for a water system, is that to create redundancy <laughs> in the system? So when we have another pipe failure, it yeah. won't mean the whole city won't have water access? Actually both, it's to create redundancy within our systems as well as um, improve our aging infrastructure. So it's a little bit of both. Thank you. Okay, well, now I'd like to take it, uh, turn it over to uh, Tiffany. Great, Tiffany Weisbach, Sustainability and Climate Action Manager for the city. The rest of the presentation really is going to focus on the climate adaptation plan update. And just to kind of differentiate between the LHMP and the climate action plan as well as the climate adaptation plan. So the climate adaptation plan doesn't really focus on emissions mitigation. That's our climate action plan. Just wanted to make that clear. Although we acknowledge that it's extremely important to think about emissions in the context of adaptation because it does indeed dictate the pace and the severity of climate hazards. So that's something that um, we do continue to emphasize even through our adaptation uh, work. So this document really characterizes the climate risks in space and time using the best available data that is uh, out there right now. Uh, it sets forth specific goals and objectives related to climate adaptation for the city, and it recommends and prioritizes policy education and green and gray, or you can think of that as soft and hard uh, infrastructure as adaptation strategies. And really in a nutshell, it creates a framework for you as decision makers and our leaders to build uh, a more resilient uh, community. And again, one that's informed by best climate science. Uh, just real quickly, I wanted to take you through the timeline of uh, this project. As Paul has mentioned, uh, the projects were completed concurrently. Uh, we started them almost two years ago, forming an internal team of um, representatives from every department um, to participate in both the plan developments. Uh, in terms of the climate uh, adaptation plan, we completed our first sea level rise vulnerability assessment in April of 2017 followed soon thereafter by our social vulnerability to climate change analysis. Again, both of those are the first analyses that we've done pertaining to those topics. Uh, about a year ago, both the draft LHMP and the adaptation plan update were released to the public in draft format. Um, since that time, uh, the Climate Action Program has conducted 51 outreach events in the community in support of the adaptation plan, really to initiate a dialogue in the community, and we'll talk more in a moment about that. Um, in January of this year, California Office of Environmental uh, Services approved the draft LHMP, and in April, FEMA approved the LHMP, so our formal approval is pending the adoption of the LHMP here today. Um, and then finally, here we are today uh, with the final of both plans uh, released and presented for adoption. I did wanna mention that there are a couple policy drivers that have really um, influenced what we needed to do and kind of um, what we're required to do. SB 379 does require adaptation planning be included in the LHMP update, as well as the safety element of the general plan. So we have satisfied one aspect of SB 379 by this work. Also, the Coastal Condition Commission, excuse me, recommends sea level rise policies in the local coastal program that are based in part on the sea level rise vulnerability assessment that we've completed. So we're making progress um, 
on getting through that LCP update uh, in the near future. So as I mentioned, um, the first sea level rise vulnerability assessment, social vulnerability to climate change analysis, you've uh, seen these images before on the your left hand side. Um, you see uh, what uh, the shaded blue that migrates inland are our combined uh, coastal hazards. So that would be rising tide erosion. Um, and coastal storm flooding. And on the left-hand side, we assume that protective structures uh, hold until 2060, and then we have um, a seawall failure uh, down at a main beach, and that's just a built-in assumption in this particular scenario. On the right-hand side, you see much more blue down in the downtown Beach Flats area over near Neri Lagoon, and this assumes that all of the protective structures, so that would be the levee, the pumps that pump out the downtown area, and uh, the seawalls fail. So you see much more inundation, of course, should those not be uh, kept up. And one thing to note is that at the time we completed the sea level rise vulnerability assessment, um, the extreme emissions scenario trajectory had not um, been available. Um, how we kind of contextualize that, there aren't really um, maps until really this week, um, have, there's been some mapping that's come out on the 2100 um, extreme emissions trajectory. But what that means for us is that we are going to see these impacts earlier if we are indeed on this uh, severe emissions trajectory, which uh, recent reports that have come out from the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, seem to indicate, which is the UN authority uh, that developed these scenarios. Also, you've seen this social vulnerability to climate change assessment. Um, the red census block groups are those that are deemed highest in social vulnerability um, that's driven by things like incidents of poverty, uh, disability, English not spoken well as a first language, um, and uh, you see the orange then would be medium high social vulnerability and over um, in the, I guess that would be um, part, the part of Westcliff where the arrow points to is driven largely by elderly folks in that area. So again, we're just starting to scratch the surface on the utility um, of this analysis, but it does give us a lot of information on the drivers um, of social vulnerability. So then the draft uh, adaptation plan update uh, came forward, and again, we have 41 strategies that are prioritized that really are recommendations for policy, education, and infrastructure solutions um, that also have uh, lots of detail in the appendix. You probably found this table in the body of the report, but you'll see things like timelines, costs, other um, actors that should be involved uh, in the appendices of uh, the plan update. As I mentioned, we embarked upon a nine-month outreach campaign to really start these conversations in our community. Um, we've been doing a lot of cross-jurisdictional coordination, presentation of our work, getting uh, presentations from other jurisdictions and kind of sharing methodologies and, um, and resources. Our outreach events, um, we were really fortunate, as was called out in our staff report, um, that we were really able to target our socially vulnerable folks, and in fact, 20% of our outreach events were targeted to or in socially vulnerable um, communities. Um, and that did uh, garner our adaptation uh, outreach uh, campaign a, a word of merit from the Northern California uh, American Planning Association. And then, of course, we have the final climate adaptation plan update. And so what's happened between the draft that you saw about a year ago and now? We have um, gotten into much more detail in our treatment of a number of things that were simply called out in the past. Um, things like public trust resources, access, recreation and surfing, uh, public health. We were really able to get into some specifics on what we could see, as well as habitat and ecosystems. We partnered with NOAA on really expanding our ocean acidification section. We have a section on coastal visitor shifts that we anticipate, um, as well as strategy feedback 
from the public and a description of the public involvement. I think importantly, one thing that I missed is that um, it's the second bullet is how does our sea level rise analysis fit into the current state guidance on scenario selection? After we completed our analysis, another update came out. But indeed, I have actually been to the Ocean Protection Council who forms this guidance to share with them what we're doing. Um, they're very interested in how um, a small city like us can do this kind of working, how we can share those methods across the state. Just real quickly, uh, red dots on this screen uh, show uh, access points. As you can see, they are a number of them coincide with our climate hazard zones, our coastal hazard zones. That's something um, that we'll be looking at through our Westcliff Drive project and hopefully if we get our grant um, through the Coastal Commission to look at beach uh, usage, access, and coastal resources. Another slide just shows our surf spots, which um, some of those are projected to be drowned um, sometime mid-century, uh, so something to be concerned about. And of course, habitat. So you also see that uh, monarch um, habitat, other aquatic habitat, and birds also coincide with some of these climate hazard zones, um, not to mention the wildfire hazard zones. So lots for us to dig into there as well, and this is really the first time we've kind of mapped this out together. Um, and what's next? Just to round things out, um, completing our local coastal program and our general plan safety element uh, updates will be happening over the next couple years. We're kicking off at Open Streets this weekend, our Westcliff Drive shoreline adaptation plan. We're very excited about this project. Um, it really is gonna take us another step forward um, with our adaptation planning. Um, continue to talk to the county and uh, Gary Griggs about a tidal gauge, um, which will really help us to understand sea level rise within our area of the sanctuary. Um, we're looking at doing climate influenced flood mapping of the San Lorenzo River, and uh, we have called out in the plan annual reporting to city council on our progress as we do on our climate action plan. So your recommendation uh, that's before you is to adopt both the LHMP and the adaptation plan. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Before we go into questions, I'd like to see, is any member of the public that'd like to speak to this item that's here? And I know in advance of the meeting, um, the Santa Cruz Action or Climate Action Network, uh, Representative Pauline Seals asked for additional time. So you would have four minutes. So I'd like to first ask you to come up and um, anyone else who wishes to speak to this item, please line up to my left. So I'll know how, how you are, then, then we'll bring it back to the council afterwards for additional questions and discussion and action. Okay, please, uh, Pauline, uh, Ms. Seals, you can start. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, especially thank you, Tiffany, for all your excellent hard work on all this and for including the public in the um, Climate Action Task Force. And uh, I want to particularly commend you on staying abreast of the latest things that are happening and mentioning that the timelines in this report will probably be brought closer. So 2030, maybe, who knows, 2025, 2060, 2050, etc. The new all the latest news indicates that it's way worse. This is what's been happening in climate action for a long time. What I have here, I have a copy. To, I gave one to Tiffany already. I have a copy for um, Mr. Banal and for each of the... One to one so while I'm talking. Um, this, is, this is an extraction from this report that was just issued yesterday. Um, the Guardian, the New York Times, and a lot of other people have written a lot of words. And I decided to just extract and comment on a few of the graphics from the report itself. So this basically is from the UN's report. If you look at this first, um, I'll, I'll talk for a minute. Um, basically, it says that um, things are extremely drastic and we need to um, take action right away. And the way they illustrate this is a series of little graphs. And these, I've given you all a report, a, a, a copy because I don't expect people to absorb, 
absorb it immediately, but you can look at it later. And in graphical form, what this is showing is where we are now is the little gray bar across. So on all these various fields on, on, on this thing, the gray bar is where we are now, and most of them are white or yellow. White is fine, and yellow is uh, getting into a more hazardous zone. We know that's already happening with wildfires, floods in various places, etc. It's inevitable that we will get to 1.5, and I'll get back to that in a second. And as we move through, that only seems like an extra half degree. What's the big deal? But you will see that in virtually, and, and, and there's two different ways they show it. Actually, I found this one more appealing. But in all these various categories, all of a sudden we're moving through the yellow, and if we hit 1.5, we're starting into the red. So some of them start earlier and some start later, but it's like going from a sort of, oh yeah, maybe something's happening through, oh my Lord, to disaster. In that difference between moving from one to 1.5 and then going beyond. So it's very important. Now, if you look at the graphic at the back, at the bottom and the back there, um, and this is UN stuff, they worked out various possible ways by which the world might be able to limit to 1.5 degrees temperature rise. And every single one of them shows it a deep shoot down. It's like, reminds me of taking my kid to the playground, you know. Only that one's too hazardous. You're not old enough to go on that one. That's too steep. That's what we have to do, guys. So... No more business as usual. Yeah, we've got to keep the lights on. We have lots of talented people. I'm sure we'll find ways around the world. People are finding new economy ways, and my friends will talk a little more to that. Thank you. Thank Next you speaker, for the please. time. Next speaker, you can keep up. Um I get through it all. Okay, My name you. is Carol Long, and I'm talking about the Climate Action Plan, and I, of course, endorse it, uh, the uh, Adaptation Plan, but we need to do a lot more than adapt. I wrote down several phrases that were heard earlier in this meeting. Big deal, watershed moment, and this is what this is. If we do not act now drastically within the next 12 years, we will reach tipping points which will according to the Intergovernmental Plan Panel on Climate Change, results in severe and widespread collapse or damage to both human economic systems and to uh, ecosystems. That six out of the 11 systems that were analyzed by the latest report by the IPCC will be under this severe and widespread stress. <clears throat> under the worst case, which is two degrees of centigrade warming. If we keep it to 1.5, three of these systems will be under severe and widespread damage. If we want to get to this best case scenario, we have to start right now setting goals to uh, do away with fossil fuel use and global warming emissions <laughs> by 2050. That means that the plan that Tiffany is working on has to set these goals, and the city council and the city government have to take drastic actions to draw down our emissions and to uh, adapt to climate change. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hello, I'm Dana Bagshaw, and um, I just want to say I'm really glad for this report. We hear so much about climate change these days and global and all, but this report just brings it home to Santa Cruz, and it points out many of the problem areas that we're going to face um, as time goes on, and the time is getting shorter as, as we've all been hurt. So I, I just want to say that um, I think this is very, very important. It should be one of our top priorities. And um, yeah, no, no business as usual. It's like the time has come now for action and um, we've got to do it. And we've got this, this map here to, 
confirm the fact that, you know, it is critical even here in Santa Cruz. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. <clears throat> Hello, I'm Susan Cavalieri. Um, as you've heard, we have only a very short time to transform our city, our state, our country, and the world if we're going to survive the coming climate crisis, which is predict predicted to occur by 2040. I suggest you look to Gil Penalosa of 880 Cities for transformative ideas. He states that we need to move from talking to doing. We need to try new ideas, and this will require guts and vision. We can no longer say we can't try an innovative idea, just try it as soon as possible, and if it fails, return things to the way they had been. Change is hard for everyone, but the most transformative change is climate change, which will impact our city as reported by Tiffany Wise West. We need to look to other cities like Copenhagen to redesign our city with open streets, safe biking, and good public transit. Redesigning our city around people, not cars, and the use of fossil fuels will decrease our carbon footprint, more put put more people on the streets to support our businesses and create a greater feeling of community. Please move our city forward to fight the coming climate crisis. Thank you. Thank you. And Nate Alexander Kennedy will be our last speaker. Hello, I'm Nate Alex Kennedy, dot Kennedy at gmail.com, 3469888. Uh, what I have to say is that us dealing with climate change is one of the most important things that we can do. It's the biggest threat to human life on this planet. Uh, with that said, there's a book that I think every last one you needs to read. It's called The Emperor Wears No Clothes by Jack Herrier. And what it addresses is that, yes, hemp, Marijuana, the same plant, uh, has literally a million different uses, 50,000 known uses uh, to do just about anything, including we could make cars from it. Henry Ford did in 1936, and then we decided to outlaw marijuana right afterwards. Uh, but aside from the whole marijuana issue, uh, what I think the city needs to do is start growing industrial hemp on its own. Not, not the stuff that gets you high, the stuff that can be used for everything else. I think we need to be a model for the state, for the country, for the world, by being one of the first cities to grow as much industrial hemp as we can, put it to use, it can be used for clothes, to make <clears throat> car, uh, clothes, paper, food, medicine. Uh, we could make everything from cars to computers to spaceships out of it. Why haven't we done this yet is the big question. Okay, uh, 20 seconds left. Um, another thing I need to say is we need to start adding subtitles to the speeches here. My phone does it, my tablet does it, the software is available for live voice to text recognition. Thank you. Thank you. Right, um, any additional comment, public comment regarding this item? Item 16 regarding, it's a resolution adopting the 2018-2023 Local Hazard Mitigation Plan and Climate Act, Adaptation Plan update. Bringing it back to the council for uh, discussion, further action. I'm prepared to move the recommendation. I just wanna thank and acknowledge you, Tiffany, for your work. This is just incredible. The report is so well written. Did you write the entire, it's, it's really thorough, really well written, Thank really you. easy to read. And there's no question that um, we have a lot of work to do, that this is a, a global concern, at, you know, and just the report, of course, that came out yesterday uh, is unbelievable. I'm wondering, um, so I'll move the recommendation. I'll second. <laughs> but I do have one um, thing. I was wondering, and I apologize if I missed this, is this in any way uh, shared with some of our state and, and um, federal representatives to let them know about the work that's happening in Santa Cruz or how they can advocate for us also? We have not sent it to them yet. We certainly can do that. Okay. Um, happy to do so. However, I know they are aware of what we're doing. As I mentioned, um, I've spoken at the OPC um, and 
other venues across the state where we've had state and federal representatives from a number of different agencies, but that's a great suggestion and I, I will definitely do that. Thank you. So I, I have uh, just well, a quick follow-up to that. Perhaps we could add to the motion direction to um, ask the mayor to send a letter to our state and federal representatives with uh, just acknowledgement that we've approved this. I assume that the vote will go that way, but uh, um, acknowledgement that we've approved it and um, look forward to being in communication with them in, uh, over time about ways that we can, uh, you know, as we can work with them and hopefully um, garner additional resources for this, the implementation phase. So, and I just wanted to make one other uh, it's, a, it's a question, it's a big question and not one that I'm expecting uh, you to answer now, but you know, I, one of the things that really struck me in addition to how thorough this is, how am amazingly well uh, organized and documented you all of this work that you've put into it, um, the, the part about, I'm gonna turn to the, you know, it's the final uh, part of the main document on page 78 on plan, the plan maintenance process and ensuring that, that we keep this adaptation, this climate adaptation plan active and relevant. Um, so, you know, there, aside from, and there's some ways that you, that are suggested in the introduction and throughout um, in terms of evaluating the plan um, and updating it over time. So aside from, you know, con so one, you have continuing to invite public participation. I think that's a great idea. I, I mean, you've done a tremendous amount of work in the past couple of years to ha hold all of those meetings, get the public engaged. So, um, you know, just if there are ways that the city council can be more actively involved, I personally would like to, I came to one meeting and um, wasn't able to come to many of them, but, you know, really staying in touch with us and we should, I think, all be in touch with you about participating in those efforts uh, so that they're, um, you know, broadly advertised, you know, accessible to the policymakers, et cetera. Um, and then how we can incorporate some of the strategies in our policymaking, um, you know, how can we help you with your work, uh, I guess is the big question and something that I look forward to talking with you more about. Um, so that's uh, what I, and then I also wanna thank members of the audience who are here speaking about this, who have continued to be in touch with us, um, encouraging us to, uh, I declare the climate emergency that we are actually in, and I, um, you know, I know that that's a, a challenging process to, to work through. But I, I do hope that we can uh, continue to have that conversation as as part of implementation of this plan. Councilmember Matthews, um, I want to uh, specifically thank Tiffany for her spectacular work in this area. Um, clearly, we are in a new time and uh, in terms of climate awareness. And I just in reference to a couple of other comments, um, cover on Western City was uh, planning collaboratively for extreme heat events. I mean, this is just on everybody's mind. Um, I went to the league conference last month in Long Beach and there is a uh, coastal communities, coastal cities caucus. Are, are you plugged into them, Tiffany? I, I am not. I mentioned it to Lee, but you it can just guess. started last year. Yeah, Rick and in. they're impressive. So um, I think that's something we could become more mm -hmm. uh, tuned in with. Um, and I'll just mention, um, I serve on the Chamber of Commerce Community Affairs Committee and Tiffany gave a presentation to that group maybe six months ago as part of the community outreach. And you think, of course, the community outreach is going to environmental groups, but it was a very broad um, spectrum of groups. And that, the, the attentiveness and responsiveness at that presentation was impressive. And I think that just speaks to the um, awareness and concern is, is pretty much ubiquitous now. And I think when we talk about um, future engagement and, and participating in commitment and solutions, we should cast an exceptionally wide net. So I, I agree. I'm, I think whatever we can do to support that direction is really important. Um, and then I just wanna say, my husband who reads the New York Times every morning thoroughly was sitting there this morning saying, oh my God, this climate action, do we have anything in Santa Cruz that would show the impact? And I said, well, I'm reading it right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you. 
You're welcome. <laughs> Council Member Crone, anything? No. Yeah, thanks. Um, <laughs> thank you, Tiffany, for all the work in, that's involved with this. Um, clearly, uh, we're playing catch up. And um, I'm not sure how to take it, how, how folks take it. You know, like seriously, like you, you mentioned, uh, Vice Mayor, that we have a lot, clearly we have a lot of work to do, but what, what is the work that we have to do and what are the things we're checking off? Because it just doesn't seem to me that we're taking this, uh, I mean, it's overwhelming. Uh, it's overwhelming. And I think for most people, it's overwhelming. It's very hard to talk about with people. Uh, it's been years to, for, to get people's attention. And now it seems like our administration in Washington is, is moving away from it. Speaking of the New York Times, um, uh, Bill was probably reading this, and it comes from, uh, the, the, I mean, so, a couple things happened this week. You know, the UN climate report came out and uh, gave us 20 to 2040 for you know, the, the climate crisis. To, my daughter's gonna be 45. Um, the guy who won the, well, one of the, shared the Nobel Prize yesterday, a, a Yale professor, he said, quote, the policies are lagging very, very far miles, miles, miles behind science and what need, of what needs to be done, Professor Nordhaus said shortly after learning of the prize. It's hard to be optimistic. I think we all share that. Uh, and we're actually going backward in the United States with the disastrous policies of the Trump administration. And I just would ask the challenge, maybe our council, you know, we've done this before, you know, we, we've, we've, we've created policy here in Santa Cruz that did challenge Washington. And now more than ever, we need to really, you know, and our, our, our governor, our outgoing governor now is also trying to challenge uh, them on climate, uh, the Washington DC on climate. And I'm just wondering how we as a public body can step it up and 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 be part of that because I think Santa Cruz and like offshore oil drilling that you know we were the first city to um, to to say no you're you're not going to uh, drill off the shore the the coast of California um, and we prevailed um, and and so what else can we do I mean there's what's the low hanging fruit I, I know that Tiffany's been grabbing a lot of grants and. Um, doing, doing a lot of work around the area of trying to address the issues of our, um, I call it climate disruption, you know, the climate change. Uh, what else can we do? I, I would just urge this council to empower Tiffany Moore to bring us stuff. I mean, there's, you know, as one of the speakers said about trees and bicycles and, um, you know, we're not, we don't even know how many trees we're cutting down and we don't, you know, planting trees and we don't have a tree inventory that really senses where, and that's the easiest and greatest thing we can do to combat um, climate change is, is planting more trees. And that seems rather, rather simple. Of course, you have to maintain them and that's a, uh, a municipal function. Uh, but I'm just wondering, well, it, there's so much that we could be doing um, and, how do we, as a, as a city, begin that process? And that, that's what I'm interested in. I mean, maybe um, Councilmember Brown asked a, a bigger question too, and I, that maybe that's too big of a question right now to tackle. I think this whole report is too big to tackle right now, uh, it, but, but here it is. Um, and reducing gas emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, you know, carbon dioxide, that is the number one thing. Everybody says that. And how do we get there? And one of the charts that we were given, but also with, and, and the New York Times backs it up, we are going to have to drastically, I mean, our whole fleet needs to be electric, for example. I mean, are we moving toward that? I know we bought some electric cars, we've got some vehicles out there, but is there some sort of plan that we need to put in place, you know, an emergency, climate plan that would uh, acknowledge like we've acknowledged our homeless and, and houseless and a housing crisis. And can we put forward something that acknowledges uh, a, a resolution that says, you know, we are in a climate crisis and the city of Santa Cruz is the city of Santa Cruz. We are not the state of California. We're not the federal government, but how do we do what, our, what I think a lot of our constituents are asking and also what, what the planet needs and what I think we know what to do. We have a, you know, the various departments up at UCSC studying this all the time. What can we as a city do 
I mean, we were gonna build a bunch of buildings downtown, we know it's in a floodplain. I saw little of that, we were gonna put bedrooms on the first floor. So we know we have a floodplain, we know that this is coming, and, and, the, and they've just stepped it up, the UN report says 2040, uh, and we live on the coast. Uh, and I'm, I'm kind of not, I'm just, I'm asking this because I don't have an answer. I'm trying to grapple with it and look for assistance in how, who, who's gonna tell the people? Who, how do we get this message out and how do we have a consistent plan in evaluating and it keeps coming back to us? Um, because right now I feel like we as a country, but also as, as a community are not moving fast enough and not feeling the, the emergency nature of, of this. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Council Member Crone. Council Member uh, Noroyan. So, you know, um, one of the things I wanted to point out and wanted to ask is, you know, as much as we might feel deficient um, and not addressing climate change enough, I know that this has been a work in progress for a while, and while I was on the Transportation and Public Works Commission, we were one of the first committees to review. So I wanna say that there has been a public review process that has really been um, vibrant and um, has, has brought the public in, and there's been several opportunities for the public, not just through your workshops, but through other you know commissions that, that advise the city council. So I just really wanna make sure that we understand this has been a real dynamic public process. Um, the other thing that I, I want to mention, and Christopher, I wasn't going to say this, but your words, your comments um, just kind of inspired me to think about, you know, what inspired the last environmental movement. It was rivers burning on fire. And so it makes me think we have to, you know, for the rest of the nation to, to look up and pay attention, we need another river burning sort of incident. It seems like, unfortunately, people don't take data. They need to see something real in front of their eyes to to make the situation um, relatable, I guess. I guess it's trying to make this relatable to people, and maybe that's what we'll finally do. And I hope we don't have to wait for a river, another river to burn on fire to get people's attentions. Um, but, and also with offshore oil drilling, it wasn't just Santa Cruz alone. I remember that distinctly because it was the issue that really brought me in um, to local politics. I remember in high school, Leon Panetta, Gary Patton, other folks came for um, uh, a forum at Santa Cruz High to discuss offshore oil drilling. And that just really piqued my interest. And I think got a lot of us in that room um, interested in being involved. And one of the things that struck me is from that, it was a movement, it's, it may have started here locally to stop offshore oil drilling, but it started to be embraced by our region and then our state, because I don't think by ourselves, we would have stopped offshore oil drilling. So I think that that's another lesson for us in regards to climate change is, you know, we do our due diligence here, but we've gotta be reaching out to other municipalities and other regions to hopefully embrace this. That leads into my question of how many other municipalities and regions have contacted you because we're seen as sort of the, um, the goal to reach in regards to climate um, adaptation and, and trying to actually um, maybe make, uh, you know, draw back some of our effects of climate change? I can't even tell you how many jurisdictions have contacted me, probably close to a dozen maybe. Um, you hit upon a really critical point in this field of work, which is the collaboration across scales because there's no need to reinvent the wheel when there are good models out there, good resources out there, we're part of a number of collaboratives that facilitate that kind of work where we are indeed viewed as a leader. I know that is maybe not solid comfort in light of the IPCC reports and that kind of thing, but we do stand out as a leader in the state, especially for a city of our size on this kind of work. Um, but it is criti critically important for us to continue that collaboration. And I loved the comment on um, coming to these events because one thing that, that uh, came out of the public outreach, one of the comments was that we need community leaders to be the face for this very critical issue, just like we have had you know, um, Bruce McPherson from Monterey Bay Community Power. We need local leaders to show that this truly is important. So I really take to heart that offer to 
come to these, and I will take you up on that because I do think that's an important um, representation that the city needs to make to convey the importance. So um, thank you for offering that, and thank you for acknowledging the point around collaboration because it's crucially important. Uh, I mean, obviously, CO2 emissions don't stop at our city limits, so we could be doing great work, but if everyone else around us isn't, um, it, it helps that we're doing this great work, it, but it doesn't get us to the goal that we need to get to. So I'm just curious, how many times do you have opportunities to go to regional and national conferences and things to, to trade best practices and ideas? Quite frequently. In fact, I'm driving to Santa Barbara tomorrow to give a keynote at the uh, Central Coast Sustainability Summit on this work, uh, not only in Santa Cruz, but in the region. Fortunately, um, our leadership in the city manager's office is very supportive of, of um, that knowledge sharing, and I do um, very frequently, um, as much as my travel budget allows, to go and share what we're doing. And it's also an opportunity for me to learn. I mean, I've learned about so many resources at these different, we can't. We know that there just aren't the resources there to hire consultants to figure all this stuff out. Fortunately, there's groups like the Nature Conservancy, NOAA, that are providing tools at no cost to us to allow us to be on the forefront of the best available science. And the only way to learn about that is through the webinars, the conferences, those kinds of things. And our office has been very supportive of that. Thank you. You're welcome. Councilmember Crone. I would respectfully disagree with your last comment. The resources are there. Um, we're just not spending them in the right way. I mean, there's something like a carbon tax, um, a cap and trade. Um, the money exists to do that. Um, getting back to what uh, Rochelle was saying, I, there's multiple rivers burning on, on the same paper today um, in the New York Times. There's a child playing amongst the dead farm animals, uh, the bones of the farm animals in Wales. Um, there's a fire burning in Shasta County. I mean, they're just putting these pictures together. There's the coral reef um, in Australia. And there's this, what they're calling now a super typhoon, you know, that's just happening and unfolding in Hong Kong. Um, so I, I, I don't know what it would take <laughs> to, 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 to get us going. The rivers are burning all over. Um, and yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I just want to say my hope is that, uh, you, you know, I mean, the fire, fires have been horrible this year. Mm. I hope that that maybe motivates people. And when they hear our federal administration say climate change isn't an issue, they start questioning that. That's, the, I think, the best we can hope for in this climate. Well, oh, my God, I didn't mean to say in Vice, political climate, <laughs> no, excuse Vice, me. Yeah. Vice Mayor Watkins. <laughs> I just appreciate the comments, and I know that one of the things I heard from the report was, you know, that the scientists did their work, and it's up for the decision makers to do theirs. And I think that's an international point that needs to be made in terms of how we're going to address this comprehensively. But um, with that said, I also want to acknowledge the amendment that the seconder of the motion made in terms of how we can relay what we're doing to our um, legislators via um, a letter from the mayor or other ways that the climate action manager has in mind for that. Is that included in the direction? Okay. So there's a motion by Vice Mayor Walken, second um, by Councilmember Brown. I'll just echo all the comments that were made earlier and also thank um, you, um, Tiffany, for, uh, for really putting together a spectacular report. I remember when um, Gary Griggs first, I think it was he, that was the first report he did, and I think we just got on, and I was just shocked by the impact of climate change because they outlined all the city municipal infrastructure that needed to be, you know, uh, adapted to address climate. And if there's, it's, it's not a burning river, but when you look at a map that shows, you know, the loss of actually, you know, are, are, are actually public spaces and, and um, private lands as a result of climate change. That's a stark reminder of what we're heading to. And I, I just would, I really appreciate the graphics that you provided in there. And I, 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 one question I had before we put it to a vote is, how do the public, you know, are they notified? Like when, when someone's in an area that's gonna be susceptible to these climate change impacts, how are they notified? Like if someone goes into some agreement with someone to transfer land or anything, are there are there things that are required for them right now to be notified of this work or any reports that are done? No, there's not right now. Um, that is certainly something that um, will be looked at 
through the local coastal program update. And I believe that in the Coastal Commission sea level rise guidance documents, they actually recommend looking at, say, for example, geologic um, disclosure um, for, say, a coastal property. Um, so those will be things that we will be considering um, during that process. And I know, I think it was 2007 that the first adaptation plan was done, is that right? 2011. Our first LHMP was in 2007. Okay. Mm -hmm. Do, and, and how is that kind of, um, I guess, coordinated with our, our general plan? I mean, do we have, has it been integrated? So these, this kind of updates now are something that we have integrated into our, our general plan. That's the second piece of SB 379 is that the planning department will be adopting the LHMP into the safety element of the general plan and that's how it becomes part of the general plan. So they will be doing that over the next, I think, year or two. Okay, I right, appreciate it. All right, we have a motion on the floor by Vice Mayor Watkins, second by Council Member Brown. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion passes unanimously with Council Member Chase absent. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, the next item on our agenda is item number 17. This is the Charter Amendment Committee appointments. And I believe if there's no one um, coming up from the city manager's office, then what we're gonna do is just treat this like we've done with other advisory bodies. H however, this is um, these are six appointments, and so one consideration is to, um, you know, first of all, take, uh, take um, the uh, nominations that come forward, and um, maybe we, we take the first pass with three, because it's, you know, six appointments. We vote, um, and then we, we see where things fall. Um, so that we can go for a second round, so that we're at least um, taking those. If, if that you follow, we're gonna. Everybody will go through, make nominations. We'll uh, we'll make the first round of appointments, and then we'll come back a second time afterwards if we need to follow up. If there's uh, any additional uh, votes for those that did not reach a threshold vote um, on the first pass. One, one thought also, and I, it's um, something um, that we've I've seen in the past is the idea of um, um, alternates having those voted on um, at this time. Is that something that um, where we could identify perhaps two alternates um, that that might be um, assigned uh, in the event that there isn't someone there, and then we have it done. So I just want to put that out there as well. Um, Mr. Brown. Just a logistical question. Would we make that decision after? After the, the six are appointed. Yeah. Okay, all right, let's begin. So I'm gonna start because I know that we were focusing on you last time, Councilmember Brown, so I thought right, every time we'll, start on, we'll start on the right side with Councilmember Cron. So you can make. Um, let's, let's do up to, up to three uh, nominations at this time. Okay, I, I would. Uh, um, Nominate Patrice Boyle, Denise Holbert, and Noah Thorin, the UCSC student. Okay, hold on a second. Okay, that's Patrice Boyle, Denise Holbert. And the other one was Noah Thorin? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Councilmember Matthews. Um, in addition, I would like to nominate Dave Schumann and Kesav Kumar. Is there a third? The first one. Dave Schumann, Kesav Kumar. Well, it, it, I'll just say, this to me is a weird way to do it. There are plenty of other people I'd like, but I don't want to over-nominate. So. Okay, got it, understand. <laughs> no. So there's two. Okay, um, Councilmember Brown. Yeah, I feel the same way as Council Member Matthews here. Um, I will, in addition, include um, Jamie Garfield and Sylvia Karras. Sean Royan. Okay. I, um, uh, so I would like um, Schumann. If it's already been said, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm just for my own stuff. nominating. Yeah. yeah. Um, Sabios. Okay, that's it. <laughs> um, she said uh, Sabios, 
Any, any others? So you, you you mentioned Dave Schumann, but yeah. Uh, did you want me to say three? If, I'm if confused. you want. So uh, Schumann, Savios, Kumar. So in addition to those that have already been said, I would just add Timory Gordon. Can't we just put them all on the floor and vote? This Do that too. I was yeah, this isn't working, I don't think. I don't know. I think it'll work. Um, I, didn't, I, I think I was just we're looking for trying to t treat it as we would our, our um, advisory appointments. Um, so... Yeah, I'd like to put on uh, Christina Horn. Additionally. But now we've got everybody but except for two. Well, we're going to see where the Three. where the, fo the four votes are. We can do multiple passes. That's. Just to clarify one more time. So now we're just going to vote for three, and then those who don't make the first t list, then we can re -nom we can that's, nominate again. That's correct. And how many do they have to get to be elected? Four. Four votes. We vote for our top three. three or, four or more. Um, four or more. Okay. So if you want to read off the, um, can we, um, do you want to just vote for three? Or I mean, I, we could vote for more than three. How would you like to approach that based on? Me personally, I'd rather vote for my six. Okay. Yeah, me Let too. everyone vote for their six. Okay. And then be able to change your vote. Okay. How do people feel? I mean, you're the boss. Yeah, I think <laughs> that I was trying to do it to, to um, expedite. I'm actually, if, did you, are, you, are all of your nominations up? Okay, um, let's see, all of all the num I'm, I'm comfortable with all, if everybody would like to vote for all of their six, if your nominations are, are there, you can do so. There's only three right now who haven't been nominated. Okay. So if anyone wants Bosworth, Brooks, or Gio. I would, I would do Joe Gio. You, okay. Did you put three on the floor already? I did. Yeah, okay, that's fine. Okay. Okay. Okay, so you can use all six votes if you'd like on this to, okay. Can you read off those? It, it's those, the only ones that have not um, been nominated are? Uh, Steve Bosworth and Bill Brooks. Did you want to um, call the names of those for each ones for, for vote? Sorry, what was that? Go by individual. And yeah, by, indi by individual. Nominee, uh, right? Yeah. Um, so voting for Patrice Boyle. All those voting for Patrice Boyle? Aye. That's three. Three, right? Mm -hmm. um, Sylvia Karras. Um, Gus Ceballos. Um, Jamie Garfield. Joe Gio. Emory Gordon. Denise Holbert. <laughs> that unanimous. Uh, Christina Horn. Christina Horn. How many? Well, I'm just trying to. One, two, three. I know. Four. No, I'm. I, I gotta say them. Yeah. I'm gonna wait and because I have so three. Is that what? Do I have two? Um, Kishav Kumar. David Schumann.
And Noah Thoron. So it looks like you have five and the sixth person is tied. We have a tie. You. It looks like Patrice Boyle and Christina Horn. Read off those that um, are, have been uh, The appointed ones? Yep. Mm -hmm. um, Gus Ceballos, Timory Gordon, Denise Holbert, Kesh Keshav Kumar, and David Schumann. So now we could do a vote for Patrice Boyle and Christina Horn. Is that how you want to do that one? Sure. Why don't we just say Boyle and we raise it? Mm -hmm. Yep. So Patrice Boyle. Um, and Christina Horn. So it's Patrice Boyle. And I mentioned if you um, to do two alternates, I would say I would I would select Christina Horn as an alternate. Could we get the idea of alternates is was not part of this proposal, and <laughs> I, I personally uh, don't support that. Um, I think we need to, ha this is going to be really intensive, and I think we need to have people who are there and committed, and if they're not there, too bad, but it, I think it's going to take a great continuity of effort, so my own preference would be just to stay with the, the group that we have and let it go at that. Any other? You know, we don't have alternates to any of our commissions. We didn't have, we, anyway, I, I would just prefer to keep it clean. Councilman Roy? Did we have alternates to the um, water, WASOC, or advisory committee? Advisory committee. We did. I think we did for the public safety committee. Maybe if if some of the folks who've been identified to serve are unable to, or kind of we can let the other folks know that they revisit at that time. At that time, or something like that. This was really, really challenging. For the way. It was. Yeah. There was yeah. an incredible number of people that over. I know. I you couldn't really go wrong with a lot of these folks. Mm -hmm. So, what is the at this point is the, the council feel that they do not want to identify alternates at this time? My feeling is. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I I'd be fine either way. I don't know that it matters if we do it now or should somebody not be able to serve. I just have a question. It just occurred to me that. Um, <clears throat> might make sense if the council is going to consider appointing an alternate to, to also give some direction as to the circumstances under which the alternate would actually serve. Is it for a one missed meeting or is it in the event that one of the appointees decides not to participate? Yeah, that's, yeah. that's, good, that's good feedback. So um, under the circumstances, I don't know if you need a motion or a sense of the group, I'd prefer that we just Leave the nominations as they are for now. I don't think there needs to be a motion, but I but I right. think I think having some guidelines um, in regards to the appointments. I was thinking consistent with what we have for our advisory bodies. When someone misses a certain number of meetings, then then they uh, they're no longer <laughs> considered a member. I'm not sure if we have a specific guideline, but there are provisions in the government code that 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 discuss when um, an office is presumed to be vacant. Mm -hmm. They're pretty forgiving. Um, you have to miss meetings for I think three months in a row or oh, okay. something like that so okay. also to answer your question about the WASAC they did that did not have alternatives okay okay thank okay. you okay well at this point then we can hold off on that so if you could can you um name those people that um reach the threshold votes for the appointment people? yes mm -hmm. um Patrice Boyle Gus Ceballos Timory Gordon Denise Holbert Keshav Kumar and David Schumann. Okay. Thank you. 
So um, in terms of action, um, um, is there a motion to appoint those uh, six members at this time based on the vote? Move to approve. I'll second that. So um, this is a motion to approve uh, Patrice Boyle, Gus Ceballos, Timory Gordon, Denise Holbert, uh, uh, Kishav Kumar, and David Schumann to the Charter Amendment Committee. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? That motion passes unanimously with um, Council Member Chase absent. Thank you. Okay, next we'll move on to the meeting calendar. Um, I don't know if anyone has any comments um, in regards to the calendar. Council Member Crohn. I do. Um, since I cannot really talk about it, um, let me see where. There it is. Um, I wanted to. Uh, make a motion to place the resolution of the city of Santa Cruz in support of educating tenants on their rights to post political signs under California Civil Code section 1940.4 on the next uh, council agenda. Any discussion? Okay, that motion pass, uh, fails for lack of a second. Um, any other discussion regarding the um, uh, calendar? Okay, seeing none, we, um, at this time are recessing to closed session. At 5.30 p.m., council members will recess from closed session, return to the days to hear from the public for oral communications. Following oral communications, council members will return to the closed session when we will finish that item. I'd also like to announce that the 7 p.m. session overflow will be available in the Tony Hill room. Okay. At this point, we're adjourning to the closed session. 5.30 p.m. for oral communication. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean, oral communications is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not listed on today's agenda. Are there any members of the public that wish to speak to us in regards to oral communications? Okay, everybody see, seated too? Yes? Okay. Um, if so, please line up to my left, to your right, and you'll have two minutes to speak. Sir, please step up, You're, you can begin. Bruce Thomas from Do Four Neighbors. I'm here to provide a brief update uh, what's happening with our petition. This is the hard copy in case. Uh, Just keep going, you can hand it after. Yeah. It was presented two weeks ago. I want to say thank you for helping inspire some uh, discussion. And the news is um, we had a four party meeting yesterday. It was a very good dis uh, discussion among the neighbors, Starbucks, Blaze Pizza, and some city folks. And it was very interesting to hear everybody's um, take on what's going on. And, um, there is a sense that Starbucks and Blaze Pizza want to find a collective solution, so positive news there. Uh, Officer Sergeant, uh, I don't know how to say your last name, Everleth, was there, 
anyways, a um, couple items to note that they, I think you're gonna be getting a form, a, a more, uh, another, another update as things really solidify, but right now we're in a state of talking about no idling signs on Dufour Street, and um, Starbucks has talked about um, adding some be courteous to your neighbors placards in their business, which was a really, I thought a really good suggestion. Talk of establishing a designated loading zone is one of the key things that I think has come out of this. Because no, 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 there was no designated space for Starbucks and Blaze Pizza deliveries to take place prior. Um, delivery times will be a key um, notion that also has to be resolved because of noise and vibrations. Case in point, and the reason this was raised to a level of a petition was, um, happened just last Friday, after two days of being woken up at midnight, um, the noise and vibrations, I called the police to report a disturbance of the peace. I opened my front door so they could hear it. It was so loud the police dispatcher could not hear me. So just, these are real problems and I really appreciate the help that's been provided because we've got some meetings and discussions going that seem to be help, um, working towards the solution. Thank you very much. Thank you, and thank, thank you. you for the feedback. I appreciate you and coming back. Coming, uh, the assistant um, city manager, I think, has been tasked with reporting back to you with the results from the planning department. Who, is that Martine, who, who's been assigned? Tina. The woman said. Yeah. It's in the, in the plan department. Tina? No, it was this. Uh, no. Tina, yeah, I think it was Tina Scholl. Scholl? Tina Scholl? Scholl, yeah. Okay, okay. Tina Scholl. Okay, okay great, so thank, thank you. you Next much. speaker, please. Hi, I'm Satya Ryan. Um, I wanna thank you for the action you took this afternoon. Um, I wanna say more about 5G in general. And my opinion is that it should not be happening at all, not just delayed. Um, I've, been, I've been talking with the planning department quite a lot and I've learned that the 5G cell towers will need to be installed every 500 feet or 40 per square mile, which um, and I'm assuming that that's per carrier, so the actual number could be double or triple that amount. I've seen the ads for the, the 5G internet of things about self-driving cars and smart appliances. And I don't know if people know this, but this frequency has only been used so far by the military for, um, as a weapon for crowd control purposes. It's never been used in public spaces before and it's never been tested before. So my question comes is like, who, who is looking out for our safety? I hear that we wanna look out for our safety, um, but the standards uh, for safety set by the FCC are based on 20 year old testing and s recent scientific studies have, sh have shown serious harm at levels thousands of times lower than that to um, humans, animals, plants. So it's something worth looking into. And also um, the 1996 Telecommunications Act, which I'm sure you're all aware of, but I wasn't, exempts health and environmental concerns from any of these tower installations. And, and how is that fair to us? I don't understand. So it seems to me that the FCC and the telecom industry are not concerned with our health and safety, so we need to be. And there's no lack of wireless coverage in this town. And I don't think we need self-driving cars and smart appliances, so what are we trading for that? You know, why are... Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hi, I'm Gail Nakunam, and I wanna thank you for voting not to streamline 5G. Um, I live across, uh, within a thousand feet of a new cell tower. Um, I don't live in Capitola, but that's where the tower is. And since then, I've been having trouble sleeping. Like one morning, I was up till four in the morning, just wired. You get wired and you get tired. And there's no way out of this. I mean, I live there unless I wanna move to the, you know, the woods somewhere, I guess. So what I'm thinking of is ways to protect myself. And I did find this material, it's called SCIF, uh, Segmented Compartmented, Secure compartmented information facility. It is what the government uses to uh, keep its uh, data facilities from being hacked and it blocks 10G. And you can use it at, in the walls. And the way they're going, you're probably gonna have to use three or four layers of this because um, fifth generation has a wide range of frequencies, as you know, and it is used for crowd control dispersion. It makes your skin feel like it's burning. Um, so I'm not gonna argue with the military. I'm not gonna wait for people to um, stop this because the telecom industry is probably gonna get its way unless we're like some other cities that are 
suing the FCC for trying to push this kind of law. So thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Um, Keith McHenry with Food Not Bombs. And um, you, we uh, rented uh, Loudon Nelson so that we could raise money for uh, um, Santa Cruz disaster preparedness plan, and we've already gotten like water filtration. We're seeking a space for another uh, container. We've uh, are collecting a lot more food, and and uh, we're prepared for like if there's an earthquake or something like that, that we could uh, respond and help the community as we did in past earthquakes and other disasters. And so um, we rented this space. I rented Loudon Nelson a num number of times. And then uh, um, about 4.30, the day of our event, I received a phone call from uh, Sherry to come down and show that we are residents in the community. And so I um, uh, brought them my driver's license, which has uh, my, our mail, my mailbox uh, at the downtown post office. It's because I don't have any other personal information about being here other than my mailbox. And I brought down our flyer to show that we actually cook. We actually pr cook at India Joe's and we um, rent his space every week for years and we share at the downtown post office. But we were told by staff that we were not residents and we'd have to pay an additional fee. And so um, th that we think is unreasonable. And now the city has an uh, additional $100 of ours, which they're not willing to return. And so th what's most important is that there are many people that actually live here who don't have physical addresses like Food Not Bombs, other than you know, we rent every Saturday and Sunday from 12.30 to 3.30. And those people should be allowed to be considered residents if they are in fact residents as we are, and that you should uh, um, not give like a roughly 30 minutes notice that you need to prove that you're a resident. So I would like the uh, $100 returned to Funa Bombs as soon as humanly possible. Thank, Thank you. you. Next speaker, please. Hello, I'm Nate Alex Kennedy at gmail.com, 3469888. Uh, I was t speaking earlier about how we've got the technology to translate voice into text live, and I've got my tablet right here doing it right now. So what I think we really need to do with these meetings is we need to make them more friendly to those that are hard of hearing and deaf and those who are blind and hard of sight. And the, as far as all this goes, we need, for, uh, <clears throat> we need to have radio broadcasts of these meetings. People can listen to, into it on their car, tune into it at home, um, where you, you don't need video. Uh, at the same time, for people that are uh, deaf or hard of hearing, we can have uh, live subtitles saying every word that, showing every word that they say up on the screen. And not only that, but the, the people who are not native English speakers, uh, many Spanish speakers around here, we can do live translations into any, into just about any other language, Spanish, French, German, you name it. And so uh, we could have a live feed of the, of what somebody's saying at the bottom of the screen on on TV at home and or up here and uh, also have up on the top uh, or one one on the top one on the bottom uh, have a translation into Spanish so every word that I'd be saying would pop up as a Spanish word on the bottom of the screen and uh, Last note here, uh, I've already said my email. Uh, you guys should know it by now, so I want to talk to any council member who's willing to take the time. So please get back to me with an email of what you have on your schedule. Thank, Thank you. you. Before you speak, are there any other members of the public that would like to speak during oral communications? If you'd please line up to my left. Any other members of the public that wish to speak at this time? Okay, ma'am, you'll be our last speaker. So please go ahead, sir. Thank you for hearing me. My name is Vince Fonts of Santa Cruz. I'm speaking on behalf of the residents of Viaduct Court. We're a small hilltop community near the Santa Cruz Wharf. 
In the last three weeks, there have been three fires along the hillside and the path below our homes. All of them have been extinguished by the fire department. Fortunately, the first two didn't cause any damage, but the most recent one this last Sunday did cause a house fire. It was witnessed by Councilwoman Naroyan, if I'm saying her name right. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, the path in the hillside I'm talking about is about a thousand foot stretch between Depot Park and the Santa Cruz Wharf. Along those thousand feet, it touches a children's playground, a BMX bike park, the Neary Lagoon Wildlife Refuge, an official monarch butterfly habitat, the Roaring Camp train track, a thousand year old trussle, and the Monterey Bay Sanctuary Exploration Center. I'd like to address three issues that have come up since these fires have begun. When responding to our 911 calls each time, the emergency responders had trouble identifying, finding, and accessing this area. We had hoped to see an increase in security or police presence, but we haven't. And we feel that it would be wise to clear dry brush and fallen wood in the area which we have done personally, but as I mentioned, there is a monarch uh, reserve habitat that we don't want to go into. So we, the residents of Viaduct Court, hope that the city council can see the vulnerable nature of this important area, consider the following measures for the depot park path. Assure local emergency responders have knowledge of its path and its access points, increase security on patrol, and clear brush and deadwood. Thank you very much. Thank you. And if you could leave your um, a mailing address or email address, so write it on one of the sheets. Um, we'll make sure that you get some follow-up also from staff. I actually have maps here if okay. anyone is unfamiliar, Thanks. and I'll add my email. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, Ma'am, you're our last speaker. Yes. You step up. Hello, my name is Tammy Donnelly. I'm here because I'm extremely concerned about the 5G. I think that if we could see all these invisible waves once the cell phone towers came in, the Wi-Fi, the smart meters, nobody would dare to approve this because we're already so saturated. There's so many health problems. There's, I'm actually became electrically sensitive once they started installing the cell phone towers at Cabrillo. I live very close to there and I help a lot of people and I've invested a lot of money and time into testing things, products and devices in the home and wearable to help protect people. But this 5G is so intense. I don't think there's anything out there to protect us that, you know, animals, I mean the whole, I know they're trying to fast forward this through the whole country. And if you guys, I don't know if you guys have listened to Tom Wheeler, who's in charge of the FCC, who's supposed to protect us. I mean, he's made it super clear that it's so important for these companies to make their billions of dollars. And he even says, if anybody tells you this 5G, you know, if they question you, run as fast as you can the other way. Don't listen to him because he goes, his quote is, it's damn important for these companies to get their billions of dollars. And that's what it is. It's you follow the money. It's all about the money. And so they obviously are not here to protect our health. So as, um, as the city and the county, we each have to do it individually. And a lot of them are not enough, but it's starting because people know the dangers of this. It's not like just going from 4G to 5G. It could be hundreds and hundreds of times more powerful. And recently, um, somebody I know that went to the Verizon cell phone told them that if you, um, that no, none of the phones are gonna work on 4G, you're gonna be forced if you have a cell phone to use 5G and that you're gonna to have to upgrade your phones and have no service, so it's very serious. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that concludes the oral communication. We, um, Mayor, could we just get back uh, information wait, about on, what the residency just, requirement is for Loudon Nelson? Um, yes, I was gonna do that if you wanna talk about mm -hmm. it right now. I mean, we can uh, ask for direction to find out what the residency requirement is. Let me ask, um, and I'll just maybe ask you, are you a resident of the city of Santa Cruz? Yes, I am. You are? And, and what is that, the address if you want to write it down and we can just check to make sure. Yeah, okay. I provided okay. all the okay. So, to staff. Okay, so thank you. We'll look into that and we'll get back with you. Uh, do you have okay. a Thank you, sir. We'll get back with you. Okay, let me just say that um, that concludes oral communication. We're going to return back at 7 p.m. for an evening session. Um, but we'll have um, uh, a, um, we'll have to clear the room now until we begin our 7 p.m. <laughs> session. So thank you for being here. His, his driver's license is there. Oh, okay. we'll let him we'll look that. at it. I mean, we don't have okay. to. Okay. I mean, no, no, Mr. Schell was asking a question. Oh, okay.
Okay. Good evening. Welcome to our now 705 session of the October 9th, 2018 meeting of the City Council. I'd now like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member, it's Crone. Here. Matthew, here. Chase is absent. Brown is currently absent. And Arroyan is currently absent. Vice Mayor Watkins. Here. And Mayor Terrazzo. Here. Before we begin, um, we did have some extra space set up um, in another room, but we're right now looking at our sole item on this evening's agenda. Um, this item is to review the fiscal and administrative al uh, analysis of the Santa Cruz Rent Control and Tenant Protection Act. Um, we'll have um, a presentation from our planning department and the consultant that developed the report. Um, We'll again begin with a presentation, then we'll follow with staff or questions from the council. Then we'll take public comment and return to the council for deliberation and action. There were two people who requested additional comment time after the presentation in advance of the meeting. That was Cynthia Berger from the Santa Cruz Tenants Association. Are you here, Ms. Berger? Okay, thanks. And also Josie uh, Buchanan from Santa Cruz Together. Are you here? Thanks. Okay, I'd like to now turn it over to um, Planning Director Lee Butler. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. Good evening. On June 26th of this year, after receiving verification from the County Clerk that the Santa Cruz Rent Control and Tenant Protection Act petition had the minimum number of signatures required to place that item on the November ballot. The council voted to do just that, place the item on the November ballot. And so on November 6th, the voters will be uh, deciding on Measure M, and if approved, Measure M would mandate the creation of a rent board that is elected and put in place various rent control and just cause eviction uh, criteria. At that same June 26th meeting, the council directed staff to hire a consultant to evaluate the fiscal and administrative effects of the act as they would apply to the city. The council did not request a market-based analysis, only fiscal and administrative analyses. Staff prepared a request for proposals and sent it out to interested parties, including the two main groups representing the proponents and opponents of the measure. We had a number of responses that were received, all from very highly qualified firms, and we selected the law firm of Colantuno, Highsmith, and Watley to prepare the independent analysis. The report that they prepared was included in your packet, and with that, I'd like to introduce Michael Colantuno to present the findings of the report. Uh, good evening. As, as expected, I'm Michael Colantuno. I'm a local government attorney. I have practiced in California <laughs> for about 30 years and have represented a broad range of local governments. My um, particular expertise is in the revenue side of local government finance, but I also have a broad grounding in all of the things that cities do. And what I have done is what you have asked me to do, which was to study the measure and gather data about the experiences of other rent control cities to help you to appreciate the impacts of this measure on your government. It's not, uh, I did not attempt to evaluate the impacts of this measure on your marketplace, your economy, your tenants, your landlords. So with that explanation, let's dive into the slides which summarize my report and allow me to expand upon it for you. The Rent Board and the City Council will be two legislative bodies in one agency. That creates opportunities for conflict because your powers will overlap to some extent, um, and it also creates opportunities for cooperation. The Rent Board will control rents, evictions, and relocation assistance. The City Council will continue to control land use, building codes, and code enforcement, and has some authority to supplement the policies of the Rent Board. The city attorney's role is affected by the measure too. The rent board will appoint its own counsel. The city attorney is required to defend the initiative, but should he be unable or unwilling to do so, the measure allows private parties to do so at public expense. The rent board can pursue civil remedies against landlords to enforce its rent control and just eviction uh, policies but it can't pursue criminal remedies. Only the city attorney has that authority in conjunction with the district attorney. The reason your charter and most charters provide that there's one city attorney who advises all city officials is to prevent 
legal fights within the organization. If you all got one lawyer, he or she has to sort of figure it out and can resolve legal disputes in that way. If you've got two lawyers, you will regularly have two opinions, sometimes three, um, and that produces the opportunity for conflict. In Berkeley, there has been some litigation between the city council and the rent board, although it's not entirely clear the law would allow that. So having two lawyers means the possibility of differing legal opinions, the likelihood of it on at least some points, particularly given that the city attorney's role will be to maximize the authority of the institution of the city as a whole, and the rent board's counsel's role will be to maximize the authority of the rent board. Starting up the rent board, the, obliga the, the act obligates the city to do it. Uh, your counsel will appoint the initial seven member board the city is required to, quote, advance all necessary funds to ensure the effective implementation of the act. Both necessary and effective have some room for discretion within them. There's room for judgment there. This is effectively a loan. That's what the word advance means. And the loan is to be repaid from future housing feeds if they're established, if they survive the um, legal challenge, and they are collected. I think all of those things are likely to be true eventually. We just can't tell how quickly. Uh, how long the loan would be outstanding. Uh, city management staff would staff the board until it hires an executive director. The rent board is to be treated like your other departments are in terms of receiving support from the city clerk, finance, HR, IT, and other administrative departments. It's subject to cost sharing as other departments are. What that means is if it's your current practice not to charge your departments for certain things like space in city hall, you won't be able to charge the rent board for those things until you change your cost allocation practice for everybody. So as long as they're treated like everyone else, you can make them pay their full uh, share of the cost of running their programs. They can request certain services from the city attorney, the building official, and code enforcement staff, but those requests don't have to be honored, and if they're honored, they don't have to be honored for free. So what will this cost? The short and honest answer is, I don't know because no one can know, because we can't predict with certainty the choices that an elected rent board will make. What we can do is make some educated guesses based on the experience of other cities, establish a range of magnitude, and give you a sense of where these numbers lie. So these numbers look a little bit precise. You're gonna see $218 and rounded to two digits. They're not precise at all. We don't have the ability to see the future that clearly. This is just intended as a ballpark. So these estimates are based on data collected from principally Berkeley and Santa Monica because they're the only cities have that have elected rent boards. And I think the fact of an elected rent board is a meaningful difference. A board that you report, you appoint, and that reports to you and serves at your pleasure is likely to have a perspective that balances the other objectives of the city. A rent board that's elected to be only a rent board and is responsible only to the voters is likely to have a perspective much more narrowly focused on rent board issues. So I think those two kinds of institutions are likely to behave differently. Presumably that's why the framers of the measure provided for an elected rent board. They thought it made a difference and that difference is likely to have fiscal implications. I have also looked at data from Richmond because it's the latest startup city. Mountain View is a startup city, but we couldn't get their data quickly enough to put it in your report. And we have a data point from West Hollywood, the relevance of which to you is debatable, which is that West Hollywood is the one city that we identified that subvenes, supports their rent board budget with general city revenues. One could argue, we haven't had a chance to talk to them about it, that was intended to make for a more ambitious program. One could argue that was intended to keep rent fees down, housing fees down. It could do one or the other. I don't have uh, any way to read the Rorschach blot on that, and I'm sure it's arguable. Okay, so that's, those are our data sources. Let's see. Um, what will actually happen will turn on such things as the choices the rent board makes, whether Prop 10 passes in November, it's behind at the moment, but there's a month ago and a lot of money to be spent, so who knows where that's going. Um, whether litigation delays implementation of the measure, et cetera. So who are we looking at in terms of our comparators and what are some of the relevant data about them? Berkeley's rent board has a budget of $5.17 million. It has 22 full-time equivalent staff. It has twice Santa Cruz's population. It has 20,000 units under regulation and its housing fee is $250 a year per unit. Santa Monica's budget is $5.7 million. 
It has 25 full-time equivalent employees. It has one and a half times your population. It has 26,360 units regulated, and its fee is $198 a year. Uh, per unit. You could say there's some economies of scale there. You could say that Santa Monica is less ambitious than Berkeley. There's lots of ways to interpret these numbers. And as I noted, West Hollywood, perhaps uniquely, we haven't surveyed all of the rent control cities out there, but that's the only city we know about that provides a general fund subsidy. And of course, a general fund subsidy is not required. That would be a decision for your council and every future council. So. Assuming a range of 5,100 to 5,800 units is subject to both rent control and just cause eviction. I'm focusing on rent control and not just cause eviction because most rent boards do not provide very substantial services on the just cause eviction side. They don't send a lawyer into every courtroom for every tenant. Most of their energy goes into rent control, not just cause eviction. So we think rent control is the right uh, data point to use in estimating, and again, these are just estimates of costs. $216 and $258 are adjustments of the numbers I gave you on the last slide for Berkeley and Santa Monica's fees adjusted to the number of units of housing that you have to regulate. So we took their fee, their budget, divided it by their number of units to get at a price per unit, and applied that to your estimated number of units, and that's where the 216 and 258 come from. Again, they end in, in two digits, but they're just rough orders of magnitude. That budget, 5,100 low estimated units times the low fee gets you a, a minimum budget of a million one a year. If you apply the 5,800 number to the largest budget, gets you um, a million five. So it's a million one to a million five is a rough order of magnitude for a rent control program in the city. If you were to grant a 30% subsidy, that would go to 1.4 to 1.9. There's a pretty wide range there from 1.1 to 1.9, that's almost doubling, but still you know the order of magnitude. It's not 20 million, it's not 20,000, it's a million or two. So what about startup costs? This is, to be quite honest, a wild ass guess. This is just my sense of what a minimal startup team would likely look like. An executive director, two analysts, and an administrative assistant just to get started. Post your agendas, conduct your meetings, write your staff reports, help you develop policies, et cetera. Berkeley's got 22, Santa Monica's got 25. You're probably looking at a lot more than four eventually, and, you, and it will take um, more than four people to consume a budget of two million bucks. But just getting started, I think you're probably looking at four people. Um, I assumed $150,000 fully loaded per position because that's about what you spend in your community development department. Obviously, 150 averaging an executive director and a secretary, an average describes neither of them, but it's just, again, a rule of, of thumb. So I'm looking at about 600,000 in just personnel for that startup phase. There are obviously other costs too, which we really haven't tried to model. Now, we looked at Richmond's startup costs because they're, that's the best um, nearby city that did something similar recently. Their measure was approved in November of 16. They have 950, uh, 9,558 units subject to rent control and just cause eviction. They have uh, 10,460 units subject to just cause eviction only. Those are units built after 95 that are protected from rent control by the Hawkins, uh, Costa Hawkins, which we'll talk about in a minute. That's about 20,000 units in total. Their budget for the remainder of the fiscal year in which the measure was passed was $1.15 million. Their budget for the first full fiscal year is $2.8 million. Because Richmond has almost twice the number of regulated units as Santa Cruz, take that 1.1 number and double it to 2.3. Your, it shows that 1.1 to 1.9 wide range that I gave you seems to be on the money. It's a, this is a way to sort of validate these estimates, but again, these are all just estimates. Who pays for this? These are the funding sources available to your housing board under this measure if it passes. First is a housing fee on landlords, which this measure says cannot be passed through to tenants, but which constitutional law is going to be required to be recovered from rents because it's going to be a lawful cost of the business and the constitution requires the business to be allowed to recover its lawful costs and a fair rate of return on their investment. So tenants are going to pay that fee one way or the other. Whether it shows up on a rental statement or in a separate bill from the landlord or not, they're going to pay it one way or the other. Service fees on tenants, 
the rent board may charge tenants for services. So for example, if they're providing information or assistance in the just cause eviction setting, they might choose to means test their services and provide subsidized services to the poor and charge a fee to the folks who could afford a lawyer if they wanted one. Um, most rent boards have at least some fees coming in, even if they're only public records copying costs. And then there's the possibility of a general fund subvention. As I said, I only know that West Hollywood does it. It doesn't have to happen. It's up to your uh, future elected leaders as to whether it does. As I mentioned, landlords are constitutionally entitled to a fair return on investment. Exactly what that is is a complicated topic. Um, the measure has a formula in it, but that formula is just a recitation of the legal standard, and the legal standard is factually dependent, which is a nice lawyerly way of saying you get litigation because there aren't clear answers, there's stuff to argue about, and when there's stuff to argue about and money at stake, people argue. Fees may not exceed the cost of regulation. Under Prop 13, Prop 26, your fees have to cover the cost of your regulatory program. The trend of the Prop 26 case law, which has been coming out of late, is fairly flexible and generous to um, rate makers. Your city made the very first published case under um, Prop 26 with the late Mr. Griffith, which upheld a, um, a, a, a fee that was calculated um, in a fairly simple way. It was a spreadsheet, I believe, from your uh, planning department saying this is how many permits we expect to issue, this is the full-time cost, the grossed up cost of the staff are gonna do it, permits divided by dollars equals a permit fee. That fairly simple fee making was upheld in Griffith versus City of Santa Cruz. Um, so so as long as they have a basis to demonstrate they're not just you know, running the police department on the rent fee, they'll be fine in, in covering their costs. So I don't think we need to have an elaborate conversation about that. All fees will affect rents, but rents are essential to fund, the rent fees are fund, uh, essential to fund the rent board. So there's this tension between you want a high fee, you have an, uh, an ample program to accomplish the social good in the world you're trying to accomplish, but the higher the fee, the more impact there is on tenants. So that balance between how much can we afford is going to be the rent board's challenge. State law, the Ellis Act entitles landlords to get out of the rental housing business. They can move in and make it an owner-occupied property. They can sell it for owner-occupied use. They can convert an apartment building into condos. They can convert a residential structure to non-residential use if your zoning allows it. So there are ways to get out of the regulated marketplace and recapture that, that real estate value. The Costa-Hawkins Act mandates vacancy decontrol. Under Costa-Hawkins, rent control <clears throat> prevents the landlord from raising the rent during a tenancy. When the space goes vacant, the landlord has freedom to set whatever rent the market will, will bear, and then the new tenant is protected again. So rent control protects incumbent tenants without respect to their income. Vacancy control protects units without respect to who lives in them. So vacancy decontrol which requires you to protect only incumbent tenants while they're incumbent, makes for a more modest rent control program. And rents in Santa Monica um, rose very rapidly after Costa Hawkins became the law. Incumbent tenants were protected, but affordable housing was not. So the rent control versus vacancy decontrol is a crucial distinction. Ha Costa Hawkins imposes vacancy decontrol statewide. If it's repealed in November, Three restrictions on rent control will go away. One is the mandated vacancy decontrol, two is the exemption for single family uh, properties, and three is the exemption for properties constructed after 1995. And in your case, that's significant because it would greatly increase the number of units subject to your rent board's authority. And that affects, of course, the scope of work and the budget. So, let's see. Uh, here's a controversial statement. The number of regulated units can be expected to decline under rent control as landlords exercise their LSX rights and as fewer rental units are developed. There is authority for that proposition. There's uh, some studies of the number of units in Berkeley and Santa Monica. There is the legislative analyst analysis of Prop 10, and there's a somewhat disputed report from an economist named Rosen at Berkeley. There are counter arguments. I did not mean to wade into these arguments about market effects, because you didn't ask me to, and because it is debatable. 
So why is it in my report? When you're doing fiscal modeling, it is important to be conservative in your projections because if you staff up and then can't fund those people and lay people off, bad things happen to those people and to your credibility as an employer and your ability to deliver services to the people that you serve. So in the fiscal context, I think it makes sense to accept this premise even if you don't accept it in the marketplace analysis setting. So we should be prepared for the possibility that these numbers will overstate your financial wherewithal and overstate how much you can fund of a program. But I really didn't mean to wade into the de debate about effects on the uh, housing marketplace because you specifically asked me not to. Prop 10. If Prop 10 passes in November, it repeals Costa Hawkins, and this measure specifically terminates event vacancy decontrol. It requires vacancy control in your city, and it requires your rent board to enforce vacancy control. And the option to um, get out of vacancy control for some or all parts of your housing market would require another initiative, another ballot measure. So there's a particular choice in this measure, and it's, it's a policy choice that's an appropriate one for your community to make, but it, but it is there and it should be understood. If Prop 10 passes, the number of regulated units will increase, the workload of the board will increase. Berkeley, Berkeley's executive director predicts his staff will double if Prop 10 passes. They've had um, rent control for a much longer time, so the number of units uh, that would come back into their marketplace is large. It's behind in the published polls, but well-founded campaigns are underway for and against, and nobody can foresee the future, because if we could, we'd all be betting on the stock market. So if Prop 10 passes, here's the impact we see on your uh, budgets. We think the number of units goes to 12,404. That's taken right out of the census number of units in your community. That's why there's only one number in both lines. Again, that 216 and 258 fee, which we talked about previously, takes your budget up to 2.7 to 3.2, rather than 1.1 to 1.4. And if you gross it up by 30%, just because one city did, you're in the 3.54 to 4.2 range. Only two recommendations. One is, if it passes, we recommend that the city council negotiate a memorandum of understanding with the rent board to clarify roles and responsibilities to provide for that startup loan and the terms under which it will be repaid. Berkeley has effectively an understanding that was worked out casually and painfully over years of cohabitation and conflict. I think doing it thoughtfully in writing at the beginning of the relationship can probably save you a lot of um, storm and drong over the years. The only second recommendation is your staffs, and that is take public comment and receive and file this report. No action on this report is recommended to you. I'm happy to take questions now. I'm also happy to get out of the way and let you talk to your <laughs> constituents and take questions later. Great, thank you so much for that report. Um, I'll ask, are there any council member questions at this time? Council member Krohn. Yeah, hi, thanks for the, uh, the presentation. Um, one of the big questions was 30%. Why, why did you include that, that at all? Because, it, I mean, it, are, there's 15 cities that have rent control in, in the state of California. Uh, is that the only one that does this, that takes money out of the, the um, general fund budget? It's the only one that I know of, and as I've told you, there's two ways to interpret it. Either the city council's trying to protect the tenants from a large housing fee, or the city council's trying for a more ambitious housing program, and I can't tell you which that is. I put it in to give you a sense of the range of possibilities for your community, but that's a choice that you have to make, as well as the rent board, and you have to make it every year. Did you mean protect like landlords from paying the fee, or why, why tenants from charging? What, what fee do they pay? When the landlord pays the housing fee, they're constitutionally entitled to recover it from rents. So if you're trying to keep rents low, you need to keep housing fees low, and using general fund money to operate the rent control board so that housing fees don't have to has that effect. Because rent, not all tenants are low income, this protects every tenant, not low income tenants, what some communities do is they let you pass through some of it, or they let you pass through all of it and then rebate it to those who prove to the city that they're low income. So they pass it through to everyone, and then you can come to City Hall and get it if you're low income. Yeah, I like that uh, as part of it. Um, this one prohibits an overt pass-through, but it can't prohibit the implicit pass-through because the Constitution requires it. And um, you're saying that on page um, three, it says we conclude a successful challenge to elected rent board is unlikely, and then you footnoted at the bottom, it's uh, 2007, that was that recently, huh? Uh, Berkeley got sued when they passed theirs and won. Santa Monica got sued when they passed theirs and won. I don't think there's any serious question that rent control conceptually is constitutional. I don't think there's a serious question that this measure is constitutional. That doesn't mean you may not end up in court about it. 
Right, and um, uh, it's, it's a charter amendment in both those cities? Uh, that's correct. And on page four. Uh, Berkeley's is an ordinance. I think it was an ordinance followed by a charter amendment to create the rent board. Rent control is an ordinance in Berkeley. Santa Monica is a charter amendment for both. On page four, the, um, it says that we conclude that the rent board must fund prosecution, uh, prosecutions. What, is, what do you mean by that? It means they don't get the city attorney's services for free. If they want them, they have to pay for them. Um, on page five, you said that um, led to conflicting legal opinions. Do you have any examples of that, um, about the city attorney represents all city officers, but that fact will likely lead to conflicting uh, legal opinions? I'm defending the city of Riverside at the moment from a lawsuit filed by the mayor alleging that his um, veto power extends to the city manager's contract. Um, that's an example of when there's more than one lawyer advising city officials, you get conflict. The fact that the city council of Berkeley once thought the rent board was too generous to landlords and sued them over their general rate increase shows you that two lawyers means different opinions. As for what it's worth, the rent board won. Um, I thought that was a really interesting um, case too. Uh, on page um, six, you said, we conclude that the city is not obliged to grant such requests. That is, they re request the city to conduct, uh, well, when, if the rent board wants a sort of money or a supplement to its budget, it's not shall, but it's a request, right? And the city council can turn it down. The only thing you're obliged to do in terms of money is loan the startup costs. According to the, um, the, way, the way the ordinance is written. That's right. Or the charter amendment. Um, I was had a question for the city manager. What, do you remember when we started like the recycling programs and the yard waste programs, there wasn't immediate income coming in from people paying bills. We had to put up a upfront um, startup costs. You know, I wasn't here when, when that was started up, so I, I, I can't recollect. Uh, I think, although it isn't necessarily completely uncommon for there to be startup costs to, uh, provided for various, you know, uh, city uh, public purposes. Thanks. On, uh, on page seven, you talk about code enforcement. Do you know of any rent board that has that power, that to have higher code enforcers, would that be one of the analysts, could that be one of their job descriptions to be also be a code enforcer or is that getting to the territory of the planning department? I don't think anybody does it. I don't think there's a legal reason you couldn't do it. I also think it's a really bad idea. The reason I think it's a bad idea is that code enforcement involves a whole lot of codes that expect a whole lot of things out of property owners. And if you've got one set of code enforcement staff that's just looking at tenancy habitability issues, and another code enforcement staff that's looking at zoning compliance, land use compliance, noise, other stuff, you're gonna have to coordinate the efforts of those two, and you're gonna create inefficiency and duplication of effort and cost. So I don't know anybody who does it. It doesn't make sense to me to do it that way. Having said all of this, this is pure policy, and if you had reasons to want to do it that way, you could. And um, on page uh, eight about the uh, fees and stuff, I assume that the $258 per unit came from the number of units divided by 5.17 million. Yes. But then what was the 216 and the 198? 216 for Santa Monica, I guess, and 198 for Berkeley. The, those are their actual adopted fees on their tables at the moment. That, that's what they charge landlords for each unit per yeah, it's year. Yeah, 250 and 198, and we adjusted them to 216 and the other number to your situation um, for uh, your, your caseload. We basically adjusted them for the number of units that you have. The only thing I really have a hard time with in this report is putting the 30% subsidy, since it's not a regular thing. Were you asked to do that, or you just did it because you thought that was? I thought it helped frame your thinking. Uh, I didn't intend to push you towards it or push you against it, um, but it's, it's, there's only 15 cities out there, so all of them, to some extent, part of your peer group. And did you say that in the report that, that West Hollywood at the time had a, a very pro tenant uh, council, is that, is that how that came about? There, as you know, there aren't very many non-Democrats in West Hollywood, but there are flavors of Democrats in West Hollywood, an experience with which I think you have experience. And <laughs> one of the flavors of Democrats in West Hollywood is their Tenants' Rights Party. That's not the name of it, but it's the Tenants' Rights Organizing Committee that had a lot to do with the incorporation of that city, had a lot to do with who got on the first council. In the uh, city of Richmond on page uh, 12, 
did they pay back their startup costs of 1.1 million? I don't know the answer to that, but I would be surprised because it's so fresh. But, but you don't know the, the status, like they're making their payments and they have a payment I, I schedule know. worked out? I, I didn't ask that question. Did they do an MOU, do you know? I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, and, and you don't know about Mountain View in Richmond? Mountain View was um, non-communicative. They're probably busy setting it up and not busy talking about it. Yeah. Um, and the last thing I'll say is with, with, uh, on the bottom of page 14, it says, even Berkeley's rent board staff council are members of the city's civil service, they report. And I just think that that's probably, they have good labor practices in uh, Berkeley. They, their executive director was quite frank with us that they don't wanna mess with the city unions. They don't wanna have a beef with the unions about taking work away from the, the union's bargaining unit. I think that's partly about how their board members get elected and it's partly about the philosophy of their board members, but they respect the union rights of the city's bargaining agents. Thanks. Maybe I'll just ask a follow-up on that question because you said it was an ordinance originally in Berkeley. Was, and so how does that, uh, here we have a, an independent charter amendment that would set up an independent board. That you, could you have something where you, these would be city employees here? This measure re requires all rent board employees to be treated as all other city employees are with the exception of the manager, the lawyer, and the hearing officers in the hearing officer capacity. What that means is that your regular civil service system with the city manager serving as the appointing official for everybody is going to apply to the rent board staff. So there's a condominium here where they work for the executive director, perhaps, but they're hired and fired by the city manager. Another topic that I think could be productively included in your MOU and probably requires meet and consult with your bargaining units. Following up on David's question, did they pass the ordinance by a vote of the people and then- These were both the, initiatives. The council went back out to the people and asked about a uh, charter amendment for the rent board? The voters initiated rent control and when some folks in the community thought the council was insufficiently passionate about the subject, they then amended it by charter amendment at a subsequent election to establish an elected rent board. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thanks. Council Member Narayan. So the, the figure that interests me is the $600,000 startup fee, um, and that doesn't count a lot of other expenses that you mentioned in here. What is your experience looking at other places where these have been, uh, where you know the fees, the city needs to provide the funding for the startup? How long does it take for a rent board to become self-sufficient where the city isn't providing funds for its operation? If the rent, um, if the housing fee is collected on the property tax roll, which may be the most efficient way to do it, you're gonna create this in November of 18. You're going to get the data to the assessor in August of 19, and you're gonna start seeing income in December of 19. So you'll see a half a year's worth of the initial housing fee in December of 19 if there's, not, there's no slips between now and August. You should be able to accomplish that unless there's a lawsuit, and even if there's a lawsuit, a courts should be unwilling to, to prevent you from collecting the money in the interim. So I think a rational, a reasonable expectation is that you'll have money coming in the door from the primary money source in December of 19. You'll start incurring costs in November of 18, and so you've got a little more than a year where you've got money out the door and no money in. Okay, so that's a, that's a year where the city is providing support for this operation. And then at that point, do you know, you know, is there an interim time between when the city, you know, is no longer providing the money to when it's fully self-sufficient? I think that you're asking the rent board to take a year's worth of income each year to cover their activities in that year and pay back the debt. The more quickly you require them to pay back the debt, the less services they can provide. So there's a judgment call to be made for this council and that board about how much you can afford to invest in this socially beneficent effort um, and how ambitious you want them to be, how quickly. And striking that balance is what negotiations are for. And so I assume that these other cities that we're talking about um, have budgets similar to Santa Cruz. They're tight, they're shoestring. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to pay for services, pay for salaries, um, you know, and we're looking at even making cuts because of the, the CalPERS or the pension liability. So have, what have you seen these other cities cut in terms of services 
to backfill this operation for a year? Like, is there a typical way that cities are going about cutting their other services to backfill this? I don't know the answer to that question, and I would expect each city, you know, there's that ancient, there's that line from Anna Karenina, every happy family is the same, and every unhappy family is <laughs> unhappy in its own way. I think all 15 budgets are unhappy in their own way. <laughs> okay, okay, so you haven't seen a typical, like we cut parks, we cut, okay, all right, thank you. I have, I have, a, I have a couple questions. Did I quote the wrong Russian novel? No, no. That was no I <laughs> That's the first time I think Anna Karina has been referenced here. <laughs> to the council. Um, I wanted to ask two questions. I, didn't rec I don't recall reading in the report, but uh, for Santa Monica, West Hollywood, uh, Berkeley, Richmond, those are all elected rent boards? There's only two elected rent boards. Okay. That's why I spend so much time talking about Berkeley and Santa Monica. Okay, so for the elected rent boards, the cost of elections, they're folded into the fee that are charged? They should be, yes. And what are the costs, if you know, uh, for elections there? Um, your clerk or your city manager is gonna have a more useful answer to that question okay. than I am, because it's it varies from place to place. I'm sure it's non-trivial. Okay, the other, the other question I had just in relation to that, when there's change, over time as you look to see maybe the cost structure of the operation changes, how does that work in terms of then levying new fees on the landlords? Is that something that's required a vote? Like when we think of we want to raise a tax or a fee on the public, is that something that would have to go for a vote of the no. people? So and is there any, any legal issue there? You, I know the rent, you said there's no constitutional issue regarding the issue of um, you know forming uh, a rent board, but what about the actual fees that are levied for the services that are being provided by the rent board? Because these are regulatory fees, assuming they're limited to the cost of regulation, which is the reasonable cost of implementing this charter amendment, they can be imposed without a hearing, without an election, without notice. They just have to be cost justified. And then is the, the, oh, the rent board would be the body that would over, oversee the justification for the that's, fee. That's right. That's cost. Okay. That's right. And were there a challenge to the fee, they would be the ones to defend it when they have money to defend it with, which will be a couple of years out. And for those rent boards that you looked at for um, the two ele uh, elected rent boards, did they also, you said they, you, you used a factor of their salary. What was, what was the, the salaries for the rent board? You had the administrative staff <laughs> estimates, but I didn't see you put in a estimate for the cost of the, the rent boards there. I didn't gather that data, but I would be surprised if it is meaningful in budget terms. You know, on a budget of a million one to two million, even if they gave them salary and benefits totaling $10,000 a year apiece, that's 50 or $70,000. I don't know what they're, they're spending, and it's gonna be politically relevant, but in terms of the kind of budget numbers we're talking about, it's likely to be, a, I don't wanna say decimal dust, but maybe a rounding error. Okay, any other questions? Councilmember Brown and then Vice Mayor Watkins. Just uh, uh, add a follow-up question there. Um, so I, I, I just want to um, be thank you for, first of all for the, um, the study. I, I really appreciated it, um, and I want to particularly thank you for um, this being underwhelming, as I um, had suspected it would be. <laughs> um, but uh, so you know, we've been hearing from, and I get the mail in my mailbox at home uh, suggestion that rent board members could be paying themselves uh, seven figure salaries. Um, I suppose in theory that's true, but it, I just wanna clarify that based upon your read, you think that that's unlikely? Um, rent that, board members are subject to recall. And this is not a town um, quiet about the exercise of its political rights. <laughs> so, so that was uh, one question and then, um, well, I'll leave it there for now because I may have other questions based upon the um, comments or questions that come from the audience. Thank you. Mayor, it looks like Transparent California has it up on their website for rent board members and it looks like just what we get as council members, 30,000 around and $30,000 benefits, uh, healthcare and stuff, about 60,000. Per person. Looks like it. Okay, all right. Yeah, Vice Mayor Watkins. Thank you, thank you for the report. I know it was a quick um, kind of timeline. I apologize if I missed it, but one of the things I heard was the 600,000 for staffing, but that the city would subsidize office space, is that correct? Obviously people need computers and internet service and offices and all of that stuff, and I haven't attempted to budget that except by showing you what Richmond is spending, okay. which is roughly twice that. 
In Richmond, that was a charter amendment or is it ordinance there, if you recall? Richmond is a general law city. Okay. So that would be an initiative ordinance. Okay. If there's no other questions, I'm gonna open it up for the public. Any other questions at this time? I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask for public comment and then there might be some follow-up questions after that. Thank you, excellent presentation and report. Um, are there any members of the public that wish to speak to this item that are present today? We're gonna start, first of all, with two um, organizations that requested additional time. Um, Cynthia Berger of the Santa Cruz Tenants Association, she requested four minutes, and then Josie Buchanan of Santa Cruz Together. Then if any other members of the public wish to speak after they're con concluded with their presentation, if you'd please line up to my left, your right, um, we'll, you'll have two minutes each to speak. So Ms. Berger, you have four minutes. You have four minutes. Um, you have four minutes. <laughs> Hi, um, I recently spoke to Nicholas Trailer, who is executive director of the Richmond Rent Board. They do not receive any pay. I recently spoke to Lenny Siegel, who is the mayor of Mountain View. They do not receive any pay. These are the most recent ones. None of their board members receive any pay. That is their, um, these are cities where, you know, commissioners don't generally receive pay. Both of those cities, they are appointed though. So those are, that's a little different. Um, but just so you know that. Um, as far as uh, just about evictions, I, um, most, of, most of evictions are dealt with in court. So just cause eviction is a law, a regulation that has to be followed, but the people who enforce that are more likely to be the court than the rent board. Um, there may be some appeal to the rent board, but evictions are dealt with in court. So um, that was just um, a question I had when uh, the gentleman was speaking. Um, <clears throat> the pay payback from the uh, payments are on schedule in Mountain View according to Mayor Lenny Siegel. Whatever deal they made to pay them back, they're on schedule. I believe in Richmond they've already paid back their original loan. That, that's what I was told by Nicholas Trailer. Um, I'm going to just uh, read a little bit here. First, uh, the report emphasizes again and again, um, financial, uh, under almost every point, that any financial or administrative support that the city were to extend to the rent board would be at the city's discretion and is not required. The separation of budgets is built into the language of Measure M itself. Furthermore, as city staff has suggested, if, if there's any ambiguity or lack of clarity, a memorandum of understanding with the rent board can be written before any funds are advanced for the transition stage. In order to clarify this matter for voters, uh, we suggest that city council ask the city attorney during your discussion today if there's any language in Measure M that would require city funding of the rent board. I think that was answered fairly well, including staffing office space, information technology, and general purchases. Um, it is the intention of Measure M that the rent board be entirely self-funding. Hey, is this part of, pause please. Is this part of your four minutes? Yeah. Okay. Are you gonna? No, I'm gonna Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Um, no, that's all pretty much that I have to say. Um, I did, did wanna say that Richmond, yes, being a poor city, but, and with a six point, over 6% vacancy rate, they're still able to charge and get um, over $200 a unit from their landlords, and they decided that that was a reasonable thing to ask. And um, the city is, um, a strange combination of both um, a richer and probably poorer than Richmond. And so I think that um, that amount uh, is not a extra high amount over $200 per unit. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Uh, Josie Buchanan from Santa Cruz Together. You have four minutes. Okay. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Josie Buchanan, and I'm here today representing Santa Cruz Together, the 100% locally funded and managed campaign against Measure M. I am here tonight not in our normal capacity to tell you and the public at home why we oppose Measure M. At this point, I feel confident that you all know how we feel and why. So we at Santa Cruz Together do not wish to spend any more of your time telling you about this measure. Instead, I'm here today to say thank you for all you do for our community. 
As elected representatives, some of you who are running for re-election currently, we applaud the effort you have undertaken to provide a greater degree of transparency and voter information through this study that has been provided to you today. The issue of housing in Santa Cruz is extraordinarily complex and highly contested. Everyone agrees that housing is a problem and that people all across the board are facing this crisis. But there seems to be almost no semblance of an agreement on a solution. More information can only be helpful in the public decision making process, especially when that information is not subject to an outcome. Thank you again for the service you do for our community and for commissioning this study. Thanks. Thank you. All right, now at this point, we're gonna to transition to any other members of the public that would like to speak to this item. Are there anyone here who wants to speak to this item? See, seated, nobody? So just those standing, um, there's three people. Okay, three people, you'll have two minutes. Hi, always nice to be back. My name is Barbara Childs. Um, I sent you a long and sort of detailed technical response to the report and because it's so complicated, I was planning to read it. Um, but since so many of the issues have been dealt with so well, um, it had to do particularly with the 30%. I thought that was an unnecessary red flag making it seem as if rent boards might actually, and I just hope the press or other opposition groups don't pick that up as if somehow um, Santa Cruz will might have to spend 30% um, subsidy for the rent board. I think that was a red flag, and even though I understand the intention of Mr. Kwan, Kwan Tuono, I love the name, um, I, th I think it could be very confusing. I also would like to reiterate what Cynthia requested of the city council, which is that in your further discussion and deliberations, you ask the, our city attorney to say very clearly what whether there is any language in Measure M that would absolutely require payment to the rent board. In other words, I, all of the literature that's going out, horrible literature, shocking literature, seems to me it should be illegal to send this sort of thing out. The help wanted city of Santa Cruz seeks help running new city department, um, create your own salary benefits and pension benefits and pension could be included. That's shocking. Um, so I just would really appreciate one of you asking our city attorney whether anything in Measure M specifically requires um, the city of Santa Cruz to pay the rent board. I think it would be good to have a really clear statement from our attorney. Um, it's complex and we got the complexity from the consultant. Um, so actually, I really, I just wanna say right now, Okay. Please, no, you can finish this sentence, finish up. No, it was more than a sentence. It was a story. And I uh, meant okay, well, <laughs> if you can send it to us, we'll read it. Okay. <laughs> All right, Thank thanks. You. Thanks. Next speaker, please. Hi, my name is Stanley Sokolow. Um, I, something that uh, the attorney just uh, mentioned confuses me a little bit. I want clarification from it. Maybe you do too. Um, regarding if somebody challenges the validity of the charter amendment, and the city attorney chooses not to defend it, then a private party can defend it at city expense. Does that mean win or lose, the city has to pay a private attorney who chooses to defend the charter? And at what rate is it, any, is normal rate or the city's rate or what? Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hello, oh, Carol Plohamus, how are you? Thank you for all your hard work in this arena. And thank you for that report. I thought it was really great to be able to read a report like that as a lay person and grasp it. So I appreciate the simplicity and clarity. So I have one question that's been bothering me for the last couple of weeks that has not been addressed either in Measure M or in anything else I've heard at the city council meetings. And this is something that came up uh, around the short-term rental, vacation rental, issue also, we don't know how many rentals are in the city. We know the people who come forward and do the rental inspection and fill out the forms and pay the transient occupancy tax and all the people that do that, but there is undeniably a large group of people who don't. So I wanna know uh, if you've thought about what will the provisions be for figuring out who has rentals and uh, what department's gonna manage that and is, I don't think the city has the bandwidth to do that. 
So where does that factor in? That's just a question. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good evening, just a point of detail from one of the previous comments. I'm reading from the Mountain View Voice regarding a meeting that they held regarding the budget for the uh, rent, the rent control program. Just an excerpt, regardless of who foots the bill, the budget for the new rent control program received a lukewarm response from pretty much everyone. Tenant and landlord advocates both said the city officials should have tried hard to limit its costs. Among its significant expenses, the program budget will create four new city positions which cost an average of about $170,000 in annual compensation. In addition to the new staffers, the budget calls for spending about $775,000 on a variety of consultants, lawyers, and hearing officers to help administer the program. City staff reminded the committee that they had a considerable $430,000 debt to pay back to the city of Mountain View for the program's costs incurred so far. Just a point of detail. Okay, thanks. And that was from the Mountain View Voice? And I, I just send the link if you have a chance to, to grab it. Okay, is there any other member of the public that wishes to speak to this item? Seeing none, I'm gonna bring it back to the council. First of all, there were three questions that came up during, during the... Uh, during the discussion. The first was um, asked originally um, by um, the organizational speaker and then came up again is, are there any costs required from the city to fund the rent control program? And that's that was the one that I, I think started that off. Please go ahead. The startup loan only. Startup mm -hmm. loan only. This, do you have another phone? But re relative to that, as I understood it, um, the city would be required to support the rent board with basic operating costs to the extent that it did that for other departments. That's right, you have to treat it like other departments and if other departments get things for f without charge, the rent board would too. My sense is that if you're doing that, you will stop. Mm -hmm. Portion to departments. Yeah. You're gonna do a cost recovery program. Okay, All right. the second one was uh, in regards to liability um, of the city to defend the charter um, for legal fees in the event, or the, a, charter, um, a charter litigation, in the event that the city declined to, to, um, to litigate. Yeah, if the measure is challenged and the city attorney were to decline to defend and the proponents or another private party defended it and they were a prevailing party, um, basically if they won, they would be entitled to seek attorney's fees under what's called the private attorney general statute. And that statute um, pays you quite a bit more than uh, a regular paying client would. Um, there's usually a multiplier applied in order to reward people for success because we know when they're not gonna get paid for failure and you're trying to make sure there's a living there. So I would imagine that that's gonna be a substantial six figure sum and if the litigation were protracted and went to the appellate courts, it could be you know, a half a million bucks. Okay, thank you. And the third question was, um, what types of provisions, maybe in other communities they've done this, uh, but to, uh, that, it, what, that have taken place to analyze the housing supply to have a clear understanding of what are the number of units that could potentially have um, an assessment for the fees or that fall under different categories of applicable law? Yeah, there were, I heard two aspects to that question. One is how do we count, just so we know what we're planning for? And the answer is we make the best estimates we can using available data sources, and the best data source at the moment is the U.S. Census. Let's hope it stays that way, but we'll see what the federal government <laughs> does this time. Um, so we're using census data and making reasoned judgments from that census data. The second aspect of the question was how do you enforce this against underground rentals? Uh, you're, you're living in a unit, you move to Europe, rent it, and don't r reveal to the government that it's now a rental. It may be very difficult for us to track that. Um, that is something that the rent board will grapple with, and it will be, I think, quite a bit like enforcing your business license ordinance. If somebody opens a business in town and doesn't tell you, how do you know about it? You may notice them, you may go looking for them, you may get complaints. Will enforcement be perfect? Of course not. There's another question I heard that you may not have that I think is worth commenting on, and that is what's the role of the rent board with respect to just cause eviction enforcement? It is not meaningless, but it is not nearly as demanding as rent control. There are two aspects to it. One is that every eviction notice has to be filed with the rent board. So there's a data keeping, data collecting, and perhaps data analyzing role that will have some cost and some social benefit. 
The second is that the Berkeley uh, Rent Board Executive Director said, See, when you evict a tenant in a rent control jurisdiction, you have to prove to the court that you're in compliance with the rent control ordinance in order to evict. So therefore, the local uh, superior court housing department, such as it is, whatever department takes these cases, is going to become intimately familiar with your rent board's requirements. And will, in Berkeley, sometimes hauls them into court as effectively an amicus to say, I'm getting these two competing arguments about what your regulations are and mean, could you come tell me? So they experience some costs for lawyers to go assist the court in the just cause eviction context. But they were up front with us, they said, we spend more lawyers' time on public records requests than we do on just cause eviction. City Manager Martin Bernal. I just wanted to clarify a little bit more on the fiscal impact. It's in the fiscal impact section of the agenda report, but uh, the other piece that's uh, unclear is the uh, leasing of uh, spaces and the costs because we don't, uh, we're, we're required, as was noted, that uh, we treat the the rent board as the same way as we treat other general fund operations where, where we don't charge rent. Uh, however, so we wouldn't be able to do that. However, we could change that practice uh, and, and charge departments, but currently that is not our practice to charge uh, uh, general fund uh, departments for leasing spaces. So th that's in the fiscal report, but I just want to clarify that. Just as a follow-up, don't we, the city, uh, the, doesn't the city charge um, through enterprise funds the We use charge of our space? enterprise funds, uh, but not the general fund departments. So wouldn't this be equivalent to an enterprise fund? It says all city departments, so I think that may mean the most favored city department. Okay. Doesn't mean they get the kind of public funding the police department does, because the police department can't be fee funded, but it means that the police department's not charged rent. This agency probably can't be charged we rent don't. either. Okay, all right, thank you. Uh, Council Member Brown. Uh, so I um, actually did, I, I do have a question that I thought might be worth asking right now since you're here. Uh, so we're being asked tonight to accept this report, um, which I'm prepared to move uh, when the time comes. But I also wanted to be, you have another uh, recommendation in the report and you s mentioned it here tonight about the city council's consideration of a memorandum of understanding with uh, the rent board should measure M pass. And so I was hoping you could just talk a little bit more about the kinds of things that might be included in the in a, such a MOU. Um, I'm fully supportive of doing that when, if and when the time comes, hopefully when for me. Um, but I um, you know, just wanna kinda understand what you consider to be some of the parameters for such an MOU. I think the report touches on most of them, but the broadly described is the startup loan and its repayment. It is um, other services made available to the rent board on what terms, what do they get for free, what do they pay for, how do they pay for it, and delineating the authority of rent board, the board itself and its staff, and the authority of other city actors. So it may be useful to give some thought to who's gonna do code enforcement, who's gonna do civil prosecution, who's gonna do criminal prosecution, can they request the city attorney's services, does he have the right to say no, what happens when he says no, those sorts of things might be helpfully thought through in the advance of any particular instance so you can have sort of decent rules of the road before you're in the heat of a political moment. So I, yeah, I, and thank you, I saw the, the overall parameters. I guess I'm thinking more about uh, things like how much the should, given that we're required to um, fund startup costs, how you have an estimate here based upon, I mean, that's an educated guess as you suggest, but if we were to be asked for significantly more for startup costs by the initially appointed rent board, is there a way for us to, I mean, do we have any leeway there? I think so. I think what's likely to happen is that the rent board will hire an executive director and he or she will sketch out an initial strategy and a budget and come to you and say, here's what I'd like, can you swing this? And there's gonna be a negotiation. That's my expectation. And if you are lucky, your rent board will choose somebody who can collaborate well with your city manager. And if you're unlucky, the city attorney will be on his toes early. <laughs> I've got a question just on 
kind of related to what um, Councilmember Brown mentioned. When you t talked with some of the other jurisdictions that have this rent control board, how much time did staff spend working with these newly formed organizations in terms of, it may, it may not be captured in the actual rent board organization, but how much additional time external to the, the work of the rent board was city staff doing to help support it that may not be necessarily captured as a cost? After the startup phase, I think it's reasonable to project that the rent board will need as much staff support as the city council does. So as much staff as you put into doing agendas and answering your questions and providing your agenda packs and, and, and helping you correspond with your constituents and all the means that you do, that same level of what I call secretariat support they're gonna need. And one political dynamic I see, particularly in the two cities that have elected rent boards, is that the easiest way to prevent political conflict between elected officials who don't answer to anybody except every two or four years is to treat the two boards alike. So there's an awful lot of, well, if you're getting a pension at this level, I'm getting a pension at this level. If you get to use a room that looks like that, I get to use a room that looks like that. There's an awful lot of conscious parity to avoid the alternative. And was that, just if I could follow up, was that cost I know you contemplated it, but was that cost ca captured in your uh, analysis? So. They've got a budget for it somewhere, and we're working with their all-in budget. Council, Council Member Crone. It, it's not clear to me if they have a budget, they're going to have analysts. You know, the, 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 the kind of thing that we get from the city manager's office is an analyst person um, and then a city clerk, but you're saying that that's not going to be paid for by the rent board itself, they're not gonna have their own analyst doing that work? I, I did not I mean, say that, to, I said right? the first thing, I did not say the second thing. They're gonna need that support and I assume they're gonna pay for it. Yeah, okay, yeah. They'll need more lawyers than you do. The city of West Hollywood has a contract city attorney who was in fact one of my mentors. They have staff counsel for their rent board. You said something interesting too, that Berkeley went to the voters, they passed rent control and then they, the people said, well, the city council really is not paying attention enough. And I mean, that's the reason I think that we have this initiative because the city council actually can't pay attention enough to the rents and housing. I mean, it is a huge issue that occupies a, a big part of our job up here, but not, you know, the, I, I just think that it needs a lot more attention. And I think that's why this has all come about. That may be, and, the, and I don't you know, this is well outside what you asked me to think about, but I'll observe that when the city council in Berkeley sued the rent board in Berkeley, it was because the city council thought the rent board wasn't doing enough to protect tenants. So it sort of depends on who gets elected when and which way the political winds are bowing and personalities and leadership and accidents and all that stuff. <laughs> I have a question um, I, just on that. What's our budget uh, for the city council? Do, yeah, just for the annualized budget. I just I don't have that on the tip of my tongue. I'll, I'll look it up real quick. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's in the half a million range. Let me just get it real quick. Okay. All right. All right. Any other questions? Councilmember Matthews. Oh, I just thank you for the report. It seemed very straightforward as someone from the public mentioned it. Uh, I think it laid out on the one hand this, on the other hand that. These are your choices. Um, and it was comprehensible to a lay person. So thank you. Yeah, I, um, uh, okay. <laughs> you want a motion to, to accept? Yeah, all and I'll second, I'll second that motion to accept mm -hmm. the report. And I'll also echo that the comments. I feel like a lot of times we don't get a lot of um, at least review, and I even think of some some of the discussion that took place regarding the housing. I'd like to see more data as far as the number of units, especially as we looked at seeing the results from Measure U in the last um, election. You know, some of our housing supply issues that we have that kind of play into these costs that we're talking about in terms of mitigating the costs of rent. And I think that will go a long way to help us understand kind of these decisions as we move forward to address our housing uh, supply. I had a question for the city attorney that about um, one, somebody asked about uh, requiring payment to the rent board from the city council. Can you say that, that you know, without a doubt, the city council can reject um, any requests for money after the startup costs? I, I can't say that without a doubt, but you've uh, received Mr. Colantino's opinion that the, um, as you know, the measure states that the rent board has the authority to request and receive funding from any source, including from the city, 
Um, and we have discussed whether or not the, the right to request and receive means that the rent board is entitled to receive what it requests. And frankly, we've had um, internal debate about that, but I think um, Michael's analysis is sound and he's concluded in his opinion that, um, that it can request, but it's the city council's d determination as to how much it can receive. Right, okay, I just wanted to make that clear. Thank you. So oh, the, the answer Sitting. to your question about the council budget, it's about 400,000. 400,000, okay, thanks. And that's factored into the full amount with the salaries that were there for the rent. Okay, thank you. Okay. So we have a motion on the floor in a second. Just uh, want, oh, I wanted to say one other thing. I yeah, wanted to ahead. point out the conclusion here. Uh, in short, the act will establish a rent control, just cause eviction and rental housing regulation comparable, comparable to those in 15 other California cities which regulate apartment rents. The city's general fund will be obligated to advance staff and funding to establish the rent board and its program to be repaid from rental housing fees on landlords when those funds are available. The rent board will be an independent policymaker with budget authority to the extent of its own resources, its own resources, and will have power to appoint some of its own staff. I just wanna make that clear <laughs> that that's what we're, what's going on here. I they feel like it's a, t a tempest in a teapot that um, this was all pretty clear to begin with. Or spending eighteen thousand five hundred dollars, probably very well spent, but very good report. All right, thank you. All right, we have a motion on the floor and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any opposed? None. That motion is accepting the report. That's yeah. accepting yes. the report. Yeah, we got what that motion passes unanimously with Council Member Chase Absent. I think at this point that concludes all of the business for today. The meeting is now adjourned. Say hi to that guy. He was good.